All right, good to go. All right, hold on a second. I want to get Chris's name. All right. Um, the chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, as ZBA chair. I want to welcome everybody to the meeting. Uh, we'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Tammy Parks. Here. Mr. Dylan Maxfield. I'm here. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. And Ms. Sarah Marshall. Here. Um, a quorum is present. I also also attending this public hearing tonight is Rob Wachilla, the planner for the town, and Chris Bascom, uh, captain with the fire department in Amherst. We will have uh, Ms. Brestrup and Mr. Mora join us later in the in, on the meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will, quest will ask questions for clarification and for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is that is heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits. The board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for the aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-13. BWC Eastman Brook LLC. Request for a special permit under section 3.340.0 of the zoning bylaw to construct an 18.87 MWAC slash 75.48 MWH battery storage facility with associated site improvements, including stormwater management systems, access road, six foot 16 foot high sound barrier wall, vegetative buffer, at 515 Sunderland Road, Map 2A, Parcel 34, RO, Residence Outline, RLD, FC, Residential Low Density, and Farmland Conservation Zoning Districts. After that, we'll take general com public comment period on matters not before the board tonight, other business not anticipated within 48 hours, and adjournment. The first order of business is ZBA FY 2023-13, BWC Eastman Brook LLC, requesting a special permit under section 3.340.0 of the zoning bylaw. 
Are there any disclosures? I should say, not, Steve. Yes, Craig. Uh, some years ago, maybe 10 or 11 years ago, I did have some interaction with Blue Wave on a project that we had. Uh, nothing came of it. I don't feel there's any conflict, in, but I, that should be noted. Great. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Um, I want to note the presence of the planning director, uh, Chris Brestrup, is here. Um, we held a site visit on Tuesday afternoon. Um, a lot of questions were asked, and I'm going to run through those questions. And if um, and this is the, this was compiled, the list of questions was compiled by staff. It's very helpful. Um, and if there's any other that we did not that I did not mention, feel free to fill in. Questions included: Will an updated project schedule be sent to the board? Secondly, well, where are the underground electrical lines being laid for the BE for the best units? And could this be included in the site plans? Could the board get a copy of the degradation plan for the best units? Did the stakes, do the staked flags currently on site represent abutting wetlands? Would it be possible that an engineer walk the site with the board to explain this design layout, stormwater runoff management, and location of utilities and the access road on site? Will batteries be removed once they reach the life? Would you consider eventually replacing the battery components with a sodium ion based composition? What happens to the battery storage facility or system after it hits a 20 year mark? Will Blue Lip Wave be owning running the site immediately after the best is operational? Would Blue Wave continue to run the site after 20, 30 or even 40 years? Who from Blue Wave will be responding to any site emergency or maintenance issue? Can the board get the individuals or the company's contact information and where will they be located? Has a Sunderland Fire Department been kept in the loop on this project? Will there be a second e exit egress point on site? Will the existing well on the property be capped? Where does all the storm water get funneled into after it leaves the, ho leaves the holding tanks? How are the tanks emptied? What is the level of protection that the sound barrier will provide from intruders, wild animals, etc.? Will the site have lighting? Be cameras present on the site? Would it be possible to have someone stake the project area on the site to the extent of the perimeter sound barrier? Is there a proposed fence in addition to the sound barrier wall? Will the applicant be providing a decommissioning plan and bond to the town prior to the issuance of a building permit? How often will the site be maintained? How do you deal with attacks on energy facilities, such as has recently been seen in other states? Can the board get more specific details on the barrier wall? This could include the wall depth, the specific materials and methods or reinforcing of the reinforcement of the wall. A lot of those, some of those questions were asked on site. Many of them needed, we needed to get uh, more information from the applicant. Um, does anybody have anything to add to the questions that were raised on site? I guess the only thing I would add is that we, the report of the site visit is that we walked the, as much as possible, we walked the site. We tried to figure out where the um, sound barrier wall would be and where the pads would be of the, of the battery storage facility. Uh, and we did get a chance to look at where we think, uh, where I think the uh, drainage facility would be and um, where the, the, the demarcation is for the farmland nearby. Um, in addition to that, I think that was about a pretty good description of the site visit. I do want to run through the submissions that we received. Uh, from the applicant, we've received a cover letter, um, an application, a management plan, a certified list of abutters from Amherst and Sunderland, equipment documentation, including equipment specifications, installation guides, um, more equipment specifications for a specific storage unit or a battery equipment specifications for a transformer empty sheet uh, we saw the lease we received leased option agreements that are executed in september of 2020 visual renderings of the site an emergency response plan an operation and management plan an anticipated project schedule or we we have an old project schedule but we anticipate an updated project schedule test pit report, stormwater report, operation and maintenance plan, and long-term pollution prevention plan, and noise assessment dated November 4th, 2022, 
written by uh, Lori Morrell, a senior scientist at Epsilon Associates, Inc. One line electrical diagram, um, a test report for the effectiveness of the battery storage system. I guess it's a United Laboratories 9540A test. We have received site plans uh, prepared by WSP USA ENI, stamped by Andrew Vardikis and Jerome Watts. And sheets one, two, three, four, and five, which are existing conditions, proposed site, sediment, site details, and also site details, as well as an extension request for a 65 day deadline. Um, um, they asked for an extension of the existing 65 day deadline signed by the uh, um, by Mike Zimmer, the Managing Director of Energy Storage at Blue Wave, that would bring the date till today to allow us to have the hearing um, on today's date. The planning staff submissions include an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission, a public hearing closed on um, January 11th, 2023, and OC, uh, the uh, OC was issued on 1-26-23, FEMA flood zone map, and the FEMA flood insurance map. Uh, Rob, is there anything else that I uh, missed for a submission? There were some questions asked um, at a supplemental meeting with the wetlands administrator, um, Aaron Jack, who couldn't be here tonight. But um, those questions are pertaining to stormwater management on the site. Um, and pretty much most of the points that you hit, Steve, from the questions that are raised during the site visit. But of course, if people want to see a copy of those specific questions from the wetlands ministry, I can always forward them to you after this meeting. Right. Okay, so if there's no other additional, um, I mean, there's no public comment that we've had no submitted public comments on this particular matter. Okay, so um, I guess what I'd like to, what I'd like to do is uh, turn this over to the applicant to um, make their presentation. And what I would like to do tonight is to uh, limit our questions during the, this is a complicated, long um, application that, um, contains a lot of things that I am not as familiar with. And I think it'd be helpful if the applicant can pretty much run through the app, his application. And we ask the fundamental of the substantive questions at the end of his end of his his or her presentation. If there is something that is just confusing, such as what is MWAC slash 75.48? Um, and so just for clarification, you can raise your hand and we can get that done so you understand what he's talking about. I might do that now and then because there's some of the stuff that just is Greek to me. But I think it would be best to let the applicant make their case and then write down the questions that you would have either on the project application report or on a, a piece of paper. If that's all agreeable to members of the board, that's how I would propose to proceed for tonight. Great. All right. So for the applicant, um, who's going to be here? Uh, who's Representing the applicant, please state your name and address and um, who you work for, for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Josh Flaherty. I'm the Senior Director of Energy Storage Development at Blue Wave Energy. Um, not a resident of Amherst. Um, I currently reside in uh, New York City, actually recently moved from Boston. Um, I Again, representing Blue Wave here, we've got a few other folks in attendance uh, from Blue Wave. Uh, you mentioned one, Mike Zimmer, Managing Director of Energy Storage Development. We also have Andrew Vardakis from WSP, who's the civil engineer on the project. Uh, and we do also have uh, Nick Warner, uh, principal and co-founder of ESRG in attendance as well, who could be uh, called upon to help uh, answer questions or, or um, uh, get more information to the board. Um, so yeah, so I, I have a, I can, share my screen and and join a presentation and thank you that was a very uh excellent summary of all the materials and communication to date um and also just before i jump into the presentation i'd be happy to after the presentation go back through the list of questions that you ran through that were proposed on the site visit um and give some additional answers in addition to those uh questions and uh if that would help or and uh how the board would like to handle those that'd be great please do so <clears throat> let me know when you can share my screen. And then um, if also, if, if you could, I also have Kimberly Kuhn, who was on the site visit with the board on Tuesday. 
you don't mind making her a prisoner as well. So I can uh, can hand things to her as well throughout the presentation. Okay. So um, uh, again, this is a proposed development, as was mentioned, 18.87 uh, uh, MWAC, which is megawatts AC of energy storage um, at 515 Sunderland Road uh, in Amherst. Uh, we'll just give a brief introduction to Blue Wave, our history um, and development and what we're currently working on and where. Um, introduction to energy storage, just very briefly going over what it is, uh, why we're proposing a project and the benefits it has to both Amherst and uh, the Commonwealth. Um, go over the site layout, um, specifically here. Um, and again, Drew Mordak is from WSB can also answer questions on the site plan. Uh, and then just go over some various uh, considerations and design features specific to energy storage and this, this system, which is a lithium ion energy storage system. And then just touch on a few uh, you know, closing items in regard to uh, timeline, uh, other items we're working on and uh, schedule. So <clears throat> Blue Wave was founded in about uh, around 2010 um, and uh, with the mission of developing community solar uh, energy projects. Um, we uh, um, were one of the companies that led the way with some of the first projects in the state, um, working in a variety of, of jurisdictions and, and types of projects, whether it be landfill solar, um, greenfield, um, uh, we've done rooftop solar, uh, and then kind of in more recent years, uh, you know, advanced as well into uh, solar plus storage projects, so co-located directly with, with battery units such as these that we're proposing on this site. Uh, as well as pushing the boundaries with things like dual use projects where we're both had solar and farming on the same parcel. Um, in about 2020, we started to uh, work on uh, locating uh, potential sites for standalone energy storage. Um, and that was fairly um, co uh, co linear with the state releasing what's called the Clean Peak Program for energy storage, which um, we'll get into in a moment. Um, and then in 2022, uh, Blue Wave was uh, acquired by a group called Axiom Infrastructure, who uh, also has experience owning and operating other large scale um, or energy infrastructure projects, such as energy storage projects. Um, and, uh, and through that transfer or acquisition and transformation, Blue Wave uh, long term it will be an owner operator of these projects, including this one. Uh, just some highlights again of the, the amount of projects and the work we've done, especially in Massachusetts, where we were founded. Um, uh, 150 plus megawatts, over 55 community solar projects. Again, a number of those co-located with energy storage. Um, you know, through those projects, we've done a lot of had a lot of impact, both local job creation, working with landowners, um, and most importantly, which is the underlying mission of Blue Wave, uh, working to combat climate change and, and offsetting carbon emissions that are generated through traditional generation. Um, just briefly going over some of the benefits of storage uh, that are present to the town and, and just generally. Um, one, financially. So obviously we do, we do work with the landowner, this, in this case, the Chang Family Trust. Um, so many all the landowners we work with, we typically enter into long-term leases, which provides uh, benefit and in some cases allows uh, property owners to you know maintain their land, retain it, um, and continue ownership. Um, the project would generate tax benefits to the town of Amherst um, for the life of the project. Um, and then again, we would look as much as possible to utilize local local labor and construction of the project in operation. Environmentally, um, projects uh, such as these, uh, the main the main uh, focus of energy storage and uh, way it operates is to reduce primarily peak or plant generation, which would reduces carbon emissions. Uh, and it does that primarily through uh, shifting of energy uh, and specifically renewable energy that's generated at intermittent points in time. Um, and my colleague Kimberly can touch on that a little more on the next slide. Um, but typically, Massachusetts has been reliant uh, when it comes to peak load generation on things like liquefied natural gas peaker plants. Um, and by adding more storage to the grid at both the distribution and the transmission level, um, so that would be the distribution level connect this sort of project and the transmission level maybe connecting directly to a substation. Um, these projects can charge when there's higher times of renewable energy on the grid and then discharge that energy when there's peak demand, typically in the evening time. Um, again, also we worked with, as was mentioned, the Conservation Commission and we have not ordered conditions and we designed the site to minimize impacts environmentally to 
um, the land itself and nearby uh, environmental resources. Uh, and additionally, um, the portion of the property that's currently being farmed uh, will also be left uh, untouched and can continue to be farmed uh, once the project is in operation. So if my colleague Kimberly is on, I'll let her um, take the take the reins here for a moment. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so yeah, as Josh mentioned, Ms. Kuhn, just uh, give your name and, and address oh, for yeah, the record. Sorry. My name is Kimberly Kuhn, um, work at Blue Wave with Josh. Yeah, so um, back in 2020, uh, the state passed the Clean Peak Standard. Um, so the purpose of this legislation was to incentivize um, the deployment of battery energy storage facilities. Um, so as Josh mentioned, right now, Massachusetts, we're pretty reliant on uh, peaker plants to supply energy during high demand hours, which are typically later in the evening, but those hours don't necessarily coincide with when solar and wind facilities are generating the most electricity. So as you'll see um, on the table on the bottom right, this shows hours that DOER outlined um, in the Clean Peak Standard when solar and wind are being generated most. So we are charging, we'd be charging our batteries during those hours and then discharging them during high demand hours um, later in the evening when people come home um, and turn on their lights and their stoves and whatnot. Um, so the DOER has projected that through the deployment of the Clean Peak Standard um, over the lifetime of the amount of battery storage that it's um, intending to deploy, that it would save the state um, energy consumers $710 million net dollars, as well as reducing uh, carbon emissions by 560,000 metric tons. So um, briefly, just going over the project design, um, so specific to this site. Um, so the proposed battery energy storage system uh, that we are uh, currently proposing on the site is uh, the Canadian Solar Soul Bank system. Uh, again, as was mentioned, this is an 18.7 megawatt AC system, four hour duration, uh, which means that the batteries at full charge can, can, can discharge for up to four hours. Um, and that totals to 75.48 megawatt hours um, in total energy capacity. Um, this system, again, is a lithium ion system. It uses uh, what's uh, called lithium iron phosphate battery chemistry, or LFP for short. Um, as you may be aware, there's a number of battery chemistries, uh, NNC uh, and um, sodium batteries, which are kind of more nascent and just, just emerging. Um, so, uh, but all kind of within that family of lithium ion batteries in terms of the underlying industry. Um, and then this is also a picture of a project that's operated by um, Axiom, again, who acquired Blue Wave, um, that utilize this system uh, in California. So I'll give a brief just overview of the site, um, uh, the layout, and then also I'll hand it to Drew as well for filling in uh, additional details. Um, but as you can see here, this is the, the layout of the battery containers themselves. Um, uh, there's, uh, again, 34 to be proposed initially installed day one. Uh, there would be an additional 17 units, space for 17 units, I should say, reserved for future augmentation needs, which we're happy to, to discuss uh, more in depth. Um, six additional pads for inverter and transformer power convergence systems. Um, so that we can uh, convert or invert the energy, uh, step it up, and then uh, put it on the distribution grid uh, to the line, ever source owned line uh, along the road. Uh, there's also a containment drainage system um, and then sound barrier and additional vegetative landscaping. So, with that, I will just hand it to Andrew Vardakis just to fill in the gaps um, and speak a little bit more to the project, specifically the drainage design um, and uh, other site aspects. Thanks, Josh. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Apologies, having technical difficulties getting to my desk here. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Vardakis. Uh, I'm a registered professional engineer in the Commonwealth. I work for WSP. We are located at 100 Apollo Drive in Chelmsford. Um, so I'm the engineer of record on the project. Uh, apologies, couldn't make the site walk. Had some scheduling conflicts this week. Uh, but like Josh said, I'll try and talk off uh, the phone site plan here. But as you saw on the site walk um, off Sunderland Road, there's an existing um, entrance and gravel road um, as you enter and loop around. So we're looking to preserve that that existing entrance um, gravel road and extend it. That's shown in the gravel patching um, as you 
head up to the north, north being up on this site, uh, up to the top of the page, and then extending to the east. Um, so that'll be the gravel access drive there. Um, and in terms of stormwater, I looked through a lot of the comments, um, but like Josh said, we had a lot of great back and forth with the Conservation Commission and the Wetlands Administrator on this project. Um, had some good solutions um, coming out for stormwater management. So essentially um, what we do for every development project is we look, take a look at the site, the existing conditions, and we run an analysis of stormwater management um, across the existing site conditions, uh, gather existing site runoff, uh, the way things are in their current state, and then we take a look at our proposed development and see what kinds of impacts we have from the development and take a look at our post-construction development runoff. And we compare the two and design um, stormwater best management practices, also BMPs, um, in order to reduce the case what we did here. Um, so as you can see, um, those rectangular boxes in the center of the site are the battery units. Um, I, I mentioned the gravel access road that's kind of um, an L-shaped um, extension as you head north into the east and with a hammerhead turnaround there. Um, so what we developed for stormwater management on the site um, were several things, but around the perimeter, we had some infiltration trenches. Um, generally, the site is pretty flat. There's um, a little bit of a crown in the center. So there's about three drainage areas we looked at. One sheds off to the northwest area, another to the east. Um, there's a stream off to the east there and another to the south. Um, so we developed um, these stormwater infiltration trenches to basically surround the site to capture any additional runoff. Um, and really there's very minimal increase in stormwater due to the development. Um, there are concrete pads for the equipment and that's generally the, 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 the uh, majority of the increase in impervious area. There, there will be gravel in between the concrete pads inside the fence area. The roadway will also be gravel. Um, so those areas will infiltrate stormwater and the concrete pads are the really only impervious surfaces. Um, so those in, 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 sorry, infiltration trenches will capture any of the additional runoff um, from the development. And then also the question came up on, on containment. So we developed a piping system that will um, each have a drain pipe uh, with a lip around the concrete edge to um, capture in the event of a leak, uh, capture a leak, and we'll pipe that stormwater to those water tanks underground. Um, so most of the time that will be clean stormwater that will just be continuously pumped out. Uh, I think that's one of the questions. We're essentially gonna have a sump pump in those water tanks that will pump that clean water out into the perimeter infiltration trench. So that clean water will just continue to drain out off the site as it normally would have before. Um, but there was questions about containment and potential leaks. So we developed this piping system so that in the event of the leak, uh, we could close off that tank and things would be captured in the tank. Um, so I think that was it on stormwater. General site design, I think there's questions on wetland flag as part of the site design and um, NOI, we flagged wetlands on the site. Um, I think there was a question on abutting wetlands. We did not flag wetlands off of this property. Uh, the flags that you saw were wetlands on the property. And then also we worked with a surveyor. Um, as was mentioned, I stamped the plans for the civil design and our professional land surveyor, Jerry Watts, stamped this, the, uh, the survey plan. We did an ALTA survey as part of this to identify property lines, setbacks, um, all those sorts of things. So we also went out and staked the limits of work um, around the site. So I'm happy, and there was a question to walk the site with myself. I'm happy to go out there and meet anyone that would be interested in another walkthrough um, to take a look at the stormwater features, the limit of work, uh, wetlands, any of those types of things. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. I know there was more questions, but I'll try and be uh, as brief as I can. Um, but that's it for me for the moment. Um, and just a couple of items I'd like to add in addition to what Drew stated, um, calling out a few features. Uh, on the northwest section of the site, uh, there's an existing uh, drainage uh, ditch and easement operated by MassDOT. Um, we are proposing a small amount of story flood storage uh, within that area that's currently being reviewed and approved by MassDOT. Um, that was done with the uh, as a result of the previous uh, FEMA flood maps, which had the base flood elevation of the nearby floodplain at 166 feet. That has since been revised down to 165 in a recently updated FEMA floodplain map. So uh, we do expect that that 
the historic flood storage area may not be needed um, uh, upon the issuance of a final construction uh, plan set. Additionally, we also, as part of the Conservation Commission process, we agreed to uh, replace uh, the culverts that under underneath the dr uh, existing driveway. Um, they are kind of in a slight state of disrepair, um, so we want to make sure those are repaired um, up to stuff and can make and handle any uh, any water drainage and uh, going through that that ditch. Um, additionally, uh, there's uh, you know as, as has been called out, so we are proposing a sound wall around the perimeter system. That sound wall will have uh, ent entirely encapsulate uh, the perimeter of the system with no gaps, and there will be two access points: one on the uh, the gate, a gate on the northwest side where the access road comes in off the turnaround. We also have a call out in the southeast corner. Um, if you can see on the plan, I'm happy to pull up as well a, a more detailed plan if that's would help, but or one I can zoom in. But uh, there's also another proposed gate on the southeast corner of the site. Um, we obviously aren't having the access road all the way down there, but there is another means of, of, of egress and exit from the site. Um, that Again, that barrier, uh, based on our sound analysis, uh, we would have these 16 feet tall, um, and we provided a cut sheet of the, a representative sound barrier material. Um, we can speak to that more in depth once we go through the questions uh, raised in the site visit. Um, and then again, the vegetative uh, kind of landscaping, uh, mostly for, for entirely for visual purposes, uh, was also discussed with the CONCOM, and we have a list of native species and plantings that were proposed um, on our plan set uh, and approved by the Conservation Commission as well. Um, so that's a high overview of the, the site and the, the site features. And we'll, again, we'll continue to do the presentation and happy to come back to any questions um, any board members have on the site. Um, these are just. Great. Sorry. Is there Go ahead. Question? Okay. No, um, the, go ahead. The screens, uh, we provided for the site that depict, um, you know, the parcel, the equipment, uh, the sound wall, and then the electrical poles as well. Um, nothing um, I would necessarily call out here apart from just uh, a couple of things. The growth shown here is would be the estimated growth after five years. Um, so not day one, but in terms of the, the vegetative plains. Um, and then that wall, again, is currently representative of what we expect the, the final sound barrier material to look like. Uh, it can be different colors or, or different uh, finishes uh, if that's something the board would have preferences on or weigh in on uh, as well. This is a, a picture of a site that we developed in North Brookfield. It's a solar co-located energy storage and solar project. Um, and uh, we wanted to just include this as kind of helpful re visual reference for what it, things actually look like on the ground. So um, in the rear of this, this picture here is the actual battery energy storage container. And then in, uh, in the, more in the foreground, you have the power conversion uh, equipment, inverter transformer, and switch gear. Uh, again, all on concrete pads with the crushed stone uh, in between. So um, this isn't the Canadian Solar Soul Bank system, but just want to include as a helpful visual reference of uh, you know, what it looks like, what it would look like on the ground with this, this system footprint. Um, so I'm going to go over just energy storage technology considerations and design features, what typically comes up as concerns for battery systems, uh, specifically lithium ion systems. Um, obviously one concern that uh, gets a lot of attention uh, due to past events has been fires uh, and uh, what causes them and how, how are they prevented and also how do you respond to them. Um, so the, the underlying cause of, of lithium ion fires is a process called thermal runaway. Um, that's inherent to any lithium ion chemistry, uh, where the batteries, uh, once they reach a certain temperature, uh, will just continue to increase in temperature uh, without adding necessarily additional heat. Um, and then the concern in the past has been how that thermal runaway might propagate or spread throughout uh, a larger set of battery cells um, that might be present in a large scale system. Um, that again can, uh, battery cells will uh, heat up, there could cause a fire or um, battery cells also as part of their design off gas as they uh, heat up. And there's potential concerns in the past over um, buildup of gas, you know, causing potential uh, explosion conditions. So what that has led to over, you know, the last, you know, five plus years, as battery storage has really quickly emerged as a, de a deployed technology is the development of very uh, detailed and rigorous standards and testing for systems that are installed, um, you know, out in the world. Uh, Mm -hmm. Two uh, I call in particular, 
um, is uh, an FDA 55 um, National Fire uh, Fire Code specific to large scale stationary energy storage. Um, that's a standard that has undergone uh, a tremendous amount of, of review. Um, the picture on the right is actually the technical committee that informed the 2020 standard. A lot of different experts from a lot of different fields. Uh, and that standard uh, has everything from uh, specific site spacing, uh, setbacks, uh, to uh, the kinds of things uh, systems and energy storage products need to become certified compliant with FDA 55. Uh, additionally, UL standards, um, most specifically UL 9540A, that's uh, the testing standard for thermal runaway fire propagation. So this was a testing standard developed specifically to address that concern I mentioned, primary underlying concern regarding thermal runaway as a cause of fires. Um, as part of UL testing, uh, effectively an individual cell is caused, uh, is forced really to enter into thermal runaway. And then um, there's testing at the cell level, the module level, and then the, what's called the unit level. The unit level being really, you could uh, view that as a single enclosure. Um, and then the, you look at the test results to see what happens in each of those cases. Does thermal runaway propagate? Um, and how does that inform design uh, features? For any system that Blue Wave is looking to spec across our energy storage sites, including the Canadian uh, Solar Soul Bank system, uh, we, you know, are only going to look to utilize equipment that shows no thermal runaway propagation module module uh, at minimum. Uh, that means that that those thermal conditions aren't spreading throughout modules within a single enclosure, and by extension, aren't spreading between uh, uh, adjacent enclosures that you know, as you might have on site, where they're like where they're next to each other. Um, that means that we feel comfortable that if there were conditions that caused uh, a thermal event in, inside of a single enclosure. It's going to be limited to that enclosure um, and uh, you know, should not spread and cause a larger scale uh, safety concern. Um, there's also a few others I mentioned uh, reference here, UL1973, another UL standard for general design on battery cells, uh, and NFPA69, an which uh, looks at standard for explosion prevention systems, uh, which plays into the design features that these uh, lift, most lithium ion systems have in the form of, uh, typically in the form of uh, gas ventilation to avoid buildup of uh, a potentially flammable uh, gases. So that leads directly into um, what the Soul Bank system has in terms of fire prevention and safety features. Um, so this is a diagram depicting the various components of the system that contribute to fire prevention and safety. So all systems will come equipped with redundant heat, smoke, and gas detectors. Um, those are critical for uh, monitoring conditions 24-7 in the containers and uh, typically can also uh, catch uh, conditions that are escalating before necessarily thermal runaway is happening or before uh, a larger thermal runaway event could happen in the unlikely event. Um, you'll also see here there's noted uh, you know, fire strobe. So there would be physical on-site fire alarm uh, strobing and, and horn, uh, as well as remote signals sent out to the fire department and Blue Wave's remote operations center in any event an alarm is triggered. Uh, additionally, um, there's again active ventilation within the system for main for uh, that activates in the event any gas flammable gas concentration is detected uh, at a certain threshold, uh, typically you know well below the threshold for uh, the lower explosive limit for the gas. And then there's also a uh, passive ventilation uh, that bases uh, that um, basically just utilizes the natural buoyancy of those gases. So if there's a buildup of those gases, they will naturally uh, vent out even if the active ventilation system can't, uh, can't activate. Uh, additionally, um, there can be uh, equipped on this on the system um, an aerosol based gas suppression agent. Um, typically that gas suppression agent is you know could could be useful for helping to put out uh, any source of a, an electrical fire within the system. so some wiring or conduit within the unit that might uh, somehow catch fire. Um, those aren't necessarily used to uh, aren't going to help uh, stop a battery with my own cell from entering uh, thermal runaway um, or, or preventing those fires typically just because of the, the underlying cause being the thermal runaway and what that aerosol based agent does. Um, again, just reiterating here the, the UL test report, which we provided to the board and the Amherst Fire Department, um, and highlighting the results that and, and that show that the Soul Bank system doesn't have modular module propagation um, or external flaming uh, in the test results. Uh, so, uh, and 
and again, I, you know, I encourage you to look through that report and see, you know, the kind of testing methods they use. Again, typically to initiate thermal thermal IA within the cell, they can use uh, one of a variety of methods. In this case, they use external heaters. Um, and uh, again, this this report uh, plays directly into this the features and the design of the system to ensure safety, uh, and also directly into compliance with NFPA above five. Um, all these things combined lead to uh, another key component of site safety, which is your emergency response plan. Um, and uh, really, the, this is a standard, I would say, nowadays for energy storage systems. If you're going to deploy a system in the field, you need to have an emergency response plan. Um, we worked with a group called uh, Energy Safety Response Group. Uh, they're an uh, extremely experienced uh, group of ex-firefighters, engineers, consultants who have a lot of experience both with fires and with uh, energy storage systems, specifically with the ion. Um, and they do a lot of work not only with helping prepare uh, emergency response plans, but they also do a lot of training with towns and fire departments, uh, as well as test active testing for manufacturers. So a lot of manufacturers will typically go to ESRG uh, and say, hey, test our unit, our system. Uh, you know, basically they'll say set it on fire and see what happens. Um, and they they they've done a lot of that. Um, that emergency response plan I'll emphasize is a draft currently. It will go undergo more iterations um, based on any additional feedback from the town um, and fire department, or Amherst Force Sunderland. Um, and uh, again, it contains recommended procedures for response in an event, what PPE for first responders should be worn, if any, um, emergency contact information, uh, and generally just what hazards may be present on the site um, uh, in the immediate vicinity of a, say, a unit that might have an issue. Um, so again, that will be we undergo iterations and it won't be finalized until the system is built and ESRG would actually visit the site uh, and coordinate with the fire department and we would, uh, the town would, and fire department would need to sign off on that plan before the system is allowed to operate. Um, I know, I've, again, I have Nick Warner on the call from ESRG. Um, Nick, if you're there, if you want to speak up and just uh, if, you, if there was anything I failed to mention here or if anything you wanted to touch on in regard to fire safety. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I think um, he might need to be made, made a presenter, Nick Warner. I just sent him a uh, panelist invitation. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, I think you captured the the safety overview. Nick, can you just just um, identify yourself for the record and where you, your name and where uh, you I'm, live? Yeah, my name is Nick Warner. I'm one of the co-founders and principals of Energy Safety Response Group. I reside in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. Go ahead, Josh. I, I think you captured everything at a high level fairly well. Um, I think you also uh, kind of alluded at the beginning, or perhaps one of the council members did at the beginning. Uh, that there are uh, a lot of nuances, uh, and this is uh, relatively complex technology. Uh, rather than try to get down into the weeds of additional aspects of safety, uh, I'll make myself uh, available for any questions that may come up either tonight or I can provide answers in writing uh, following the meeting. But uh, we've been involved in the deployment of energy storage systems uh, all over the U.S., actually uh, around the globe. We have a, a range of projects going on in Massachusetts, uh, throughout the greater New England area, uh, New York uh, in particular. Uh, we're well versed in uh, the response capabilities of the area. And I look forward to continuing to work with uh, communities in Massachusetts to get these in safely. Thank you, Nick. And the last thing I'll mention before moving on is, um, as the, the board is aware, the, um, the fire department did review our application and provide comments. Um, Blue Wave, you know, appreciates the comments from the fire department and uh, agrees with all the recommendations in that comment letter, as well as the, the required compliance with uh, the standards uh, mentioned, uh, all of which overlap with um, uh, the ones referenced here. Um, and again, just final, there's additional, maybe more general storage and site safety um, components to consider uh, beyond from a, a fire perspective. Um, there are questions about kind of site security, you know, what happens, uh, you know, based on recent events when there's been people targeting substations or electrical infrastructure equipment. Um, again, all of this battery enclosures are housed in steel containers. 
Uh, they're locked 24 seven um, and are, can only be opened by certified technicians or personnel. Uh, again, additionally, there'll be this uh, 16 foot sound wall around the perimeter of the system that will fully enclose the, the footprint and also have a lock gate. They'll have a Knox box for fire and police department access. Um, <clears throat> again, site plan reviewed by the fire, <clears throat> well, fire department for input on safety and accessibility. Uh, from an electrical safety perspective, of course, it is an active electrical site, uh, medium and high voltage. So there is redundant grounding and also um, plenty of, of signage and warning uh, on the equipment and will be present on site uh, for access to you know, make sure that people are aware of that risk. Um, all the components undergo additional testing certification for this general electrical code, science and safety. And then uh, another key component to mention is um, the system is always monitored 24 seven remotely, will be by Blue Wave and likely also may be monitored redundantly by the manufacturer. Um, that's monitoring temperature, voltage, any conditions um, uh, in the site. If the door on one of the enclosures opens, we will know about it immediately. Um, and uh, the system is, is automatically triggered to shut off remotely on its own. If an alarm's triggered or if anything, uh, any abnormal conditions are detected, uh, and Blue Egg would also have the capability to shut off the system remotely at any time. I'll uh, pass it back to my colleague, Kimberly, to go over sound uh, implications of the system. Yeah, so we worked with um, a group called Epsilon Associates to conduct um, sound measurements and analysis. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, the Department of Environmental Protection has sound guidelines um, where at the property boundaries, new developments can't increase um, ambient sound conditions by more than 10 decibels. Um, so Epsilon went out to the site and measured over a seven day period um, the sound levels at that site to collect data on um, the ambient sound conditions there. Um, and from their analysis, um, so our battery storage facility, um, we have inverter pads, inverters on, on pads, as well as um, battery units that have HVAC. Um, systems in them that generate some level of noise. Um, and so in order to mitigate that, as we've discussed, um, we're proposing a 16 foot tall sound barrier that's going to surround the entire system. Um, and in addition, we're gonna be implementing some operating restrictions that would um, restrict that, the hours so that not, not all batteries are operating at once. So that is done in order to make sure that um, at the property boundaries, we're still in compliance with the DEP sound regulations. And I'll add a couple of quick things as well. So going back to slide, so uh, here. Um, this sound graph, again, this shows those decibel levels over Sunday periods, as I mentioned. Uh, interesting to note, so as or some might would say logical, um, Sunderland's a busy road. Um, so during the day, the site does get actually fairly loud um, and then drops off a lot at night. So typically, as with most sites, what we're mitigating to is that average decibel rating at nighttime, um, which tends to be a bit quieter than during the day. Um, and then the last thing, or the other thing I'll say is, um, so again, these are the sound contours on site. Um, and, uh, you know, design, there's potential for, as always, with equipment change, design change, potentially prior to construction. So um, as with other projects, we've all, always, of course, I'm sure the board would, would want this anyway recommend uh, you know, met sound measurements uh, post-construction to ensure compliance with DEP. And if that's not you know, present, then we would have to, to provide further mitigation in order to ensure that that, that, uh, that regulation and requirement is met. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give a brief uh, overview just of our other uh, work we're currently, uh, that's under, undergoing on the projects and also other permits we're, we've applied for or working on. Um, so this is a table just of, of the permits, including the special permit for ZDA. Um, again, we have already received our permissions from the CONCOM. We also have a DOT access permit um, since we are crossing that drainage easement um, and coming in off of Summer Road, which is the state highway. Uh, the fire department identified in their letter a need to apply for a fire permit directly with them, which we will be doing uh, post-CDA um, decision, hopefully approval. Uh, we are currently being studied with the utility Eversource uh, for our interconnection agreement. Um, we're expecting that ISA uh, later this year. That ISA is obviously a key component. 
that actually allows us to interconnect to the grid um, at the size we're being studied at and uh, in, in order to continue operating and, and charging and discharging from the grid. Uh, and then finally, a building permit as well, um, of course, after all uh, non-ministerial permits are obtained. So we would, you know, our intent is to, to update and convey, continue updating all town boards we're involved with, our progress with DOT, with the fire department, uh, and making sure that uh, no one's out of the loop as to, you know, any stage of the process, what the project, where the project is, or what it's worked on. Uh, finally, uh, just want to go over just briefly construction and O&M. Um, I, as was mentioned, we had provided a construction schedule with the initial application. Since our initial application was last August, um, it is outdated and we'll, we'll certainly provide an updated schedule. Um, we're expecting construction to last at most four to six months uh, and likely begin in, at the beginning of 2024 at this point um, with non-intrusive operation to follow for at least 20 years. Um, we'll obviously work and, and more than welcome any conditions, um, standard conditions the board has regarding construction for you know, time of day or days of the week, um, mitigating dust, sound, et cetera. Once the system's operating, um, again, it pretty much operates on its own and is monitored remotely. Um, at most during regular operation, there should be quarterly visits or biannuals, uh, maintenance visits for inspection of various equipment. Uh, that could be the, the HVAC or coolers within the units, um, checking the transformer inverters, um, generally just inspection, inspecting the site conditions. Uh, and uh, we did provide a sample O&M schedule with our application um, if the board has had an opportunity to look at that. Um, and then uh, we have mentioned this before and we'll have, have to answer more questions on this. Uh, due to the inherent nature of uh, these systems, they typically undergo degradation over time and the most degradation happening within the first year of operation. So we do anticipate, and that's why we, uh, in our footprint have allowed for uh, room for additional batteries to be installed. Um, to be clear on two things, one, those additional batteries will not allow us to charge or discharge more than that 18.87 that megawatts AC. Um, and the uh, extra batteries are, are installed only to keep us at the initial uh, megawatt hours that roughly 75 megawatt hours that we have proposed. Uh, finally, um, we would, of course, welcome and, and happily provide a decommissioning estimate uh, and decommissioning bond um, that the town would, would hold uh, for the property to or project to be dismantled and, and uh, taken away from the site uh, at the end of the system life. Um, that's the end of the presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions there um, before I jump into the questions the board had from their side of the Let's, um, I think the best way to proceed would be to let's go to those questions that we had on site and then we can um, work through uh, questions that people have individually. So let me just find that uh, list of questions again and sure. we can run through that. What's the problem with these large, these large applications is a lot of paper and I tend to set it down and don't know where it goes. Um, Rob, do you have that list of questions that you can throw up on the screen? Yeah, let me just uh, pull that up. Real you quick. emailed them? I believe so. Uh, let's see. Just give me one second. Yeah, that can work with that for everybody here. Okay. Rob, I found them. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Yep. All right. So the first one is. Um, Project schedule to be sent to the board. I think you addressed that one, uh, Mr. Larcy. Yes, that, we will. Uh, we'll you, send a letter. you will. And we that's something we would need, I think, before approving. That's something we would need before approving the application. So that's that's to come. Um, one of the things that if you perhaps you should, can bring up your site plan uh, for the electrical lines being waived for the best units. I don't know if this is. I don't think they're included on the site plan on the site plans. Um, and I, we may need some more detail on some of the site plans, but in the I know in the project application, you said you say there is both underground and above ground connection to uh, Eversource, I think is what it was. Can you show us where that is? Sure. So let me know if you can see my plan on the screen. We can. Yep. So yeah, so there will be um, 
So the connection uh, down here, you can see, I'll zoom in a little more. So this marking right here, this is the existing Eversource uh, pole um, that's on, yeah. on opposite the road. Um, so we yeah. have that to come overhead to this series of poles here, then proceed underground, pass on to the, the sound barrier, and then uh, again, kind of come up to another series of poles here. Those poles are required for necessary equipment that Eversource requires for all projects. Um, so that under that connection from this last pole would likely then run underground again to these equipment pads here. Uh, these are going to contain the power conversion systems and, sw and necessary switch gear, which are basically aggregating all of the, the energy from these battery units. So there will be the section of the only overhead line on the site will be the section um, basically among these poles and then out toward the road. All other uh, electrical connections will be um, participated to be underground. So basically, all of the units uh, will have typically um, conduit emerge from the roughly the middle of the containers immediately down through the equipment pad. And those will go down usually no more than two and a half to three feet um, below grade. And then they'll run underground up to these equipment pads that have the inverse transformers on them. So typically, so in most products I've worked on, we, we don't typically, those showing the actual home runs, um, what they're referred to and conduit runs, uh, typically doesn't happen until more construction level design. Um, but if the board wants to see that on the plans, we can certainly look to try to add um, notation for like preliminary conduit run markings. Uh, you know, again, it, it'll, it would be finalized, of course, with the construction level plan set and signed up by the electrical inspector, but um, we can provide something preliminary. Um, so the one, I guess the one thing I noticed is that the, the pole, the light, the um, for, uh, power poles, for lack of a better term, there's three currently on site. You're, you're gonna propose more on site, both down low and then up on the top. And those aren't on the rendering right now. The renderings don't, I don't, I guess they contain the, some inside the, um, some inside the, the sound barrier, but there'd be additional power line, power poles um, than is in the rendering. Is that correct? Yeah, so let me just um, point up the renderings now. So I, I think yep. we show all of the new poll. I think, I, I think you might be correct. So I, we do, I think the, the poles close to the road, we're showing new poles, but they're not entirely, they don't match exactly to the plans. So we can we can have that updated. Um, and I think there's just one I see. poll missing, but um, yes, yeah, so that's, but you're you're correct. And yeah, we start happy to update the renderings to reflect that. Um, All right. And yes, yeah. And again, the underlying cause for the additional polls is uh, again, typically that, so Eversource, those first three poles coming off of the road, those will actually be owned by Eversource and they'll have their equipment on it. And then uh, from that last poll, it's referred to as the point of coming coupling. That from that point on, that'll all be Blue Wave owned equipment. And then those other three poles closer to the system batteries um, will have basically mirror the Eversource equipment just on, on our side. Uh, Mr. Meadows, is that your question about the underlying, uh, under, uh, the power lines, the electrical lines? No, it wasn't. On the site? No. Okay. All right. I think the next one is your question about the degradation plan. Um, can the board get a copy of the degradation plan for the best units? Yeah, so uh, I'll, uh, so to start, so we, the degradation schedule or, or anticipated schedule for the units um, is confidential to the cane solar, so we would have to ask for permission to share it with the board, um, which we are happy to do. Um, I would. I was curious if there was a specific concern here that the board was looking for. Is if it's just to kind of match the degradation with maybe like when we would anticipate adding additional units to the site, or if there was some other concern. But again, we'll just have to reach out for permission to share that exact schedule. But um, at the very least, we could we could probably give a uh, at least a schedule of when we anticipate adding units, which correlates to the to the degradation. So, Mr. Meadows, is that um meet your is that, give you the I information so. you want i'd like to, i'd like to see it before i see if you're sure yeah okay so that'd be good to have um mr Watt, rob 
So just a follow-up question to uh, what Mr. Larry C. said. So are you requesting permission from the manufacturer? Correct. The, okay. The, the degradation schedules for priority Canadian solar, so we'd have to okay. ask them. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, a question about where the stakes flags, the stake flags currently on site represent abutting wetlands. The answer is no. Those are, represent the wetlands on the property, right? Correct. Um, so yeah, there's flagging okay. for the on property, uh, and then I think there might be a later question, but I know there was. It sounds like there was some confusion on site as to some stakes also on the interior of the okay. property. There, those there are stakes out, out on the property that are effectively the vertices of the limited work, but we can before. Mm -hmm. um, we have a follow-up site visit with our engineer, we can have like more uh, thorough flagging of the limited work. That'd be great. And we can schedule something with you. We'll work with the staff to schedule something to do that. Sure. Um, I think you've already answered this, the next question, mm -hmm. which is will batteries be removed once they reach the end of the usable life cycle? I think you said you, you would not remove them. You just add additional to make sure you reach that capacity or the limit. Is that correct? Uh, I'll clarify a little bit. So um, over the first okay. estimated 20 years, no batteries will be removed unless, of course, there's, say, a faulty battery cell or something. In that case, we would replace a rack typically within an enclosure, but we wouldn't remove the actual enclosure. Um, but for the first 20 years, we would just add those additional units. At the end of 20 years, it is expected that those batteries are at the end of their useful life. So at that point, we would either have to, uh, let's say, um, there, there, there's a number of factors that go into whether or not we would do what's called effective repowering, which is replacing the batteries with new ones to keep the capacity up um, where it needs to be. Um, uh, to do that, um, we would at that point in time evaluate whether or not you know we would do so, and if so, which batteries we would look to procure. If we don't do that, we would then remove all the batteries uh, from the site and restore the site to the condition. If members of the board have any further follow-up questions to any of this, just raise your hand and let me know. I'll, I'll... Ms. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, just regarding the um, the degradation um, schedule, I, everything that's submitted to the board is a public document, right? So it's just something to be aware of, I don't think. If confidential, if proprietary information is being shared with us, we can't keep it confident. I mean, it has to be available to the public. No, I would. I just wanted to yeah, float that. So, I think that's right. It's a public. It'd be a public document. And if it helps, I you know can't provide the exact schedule. Again, if the concern is if the if we if it helps to know what this what answer you're looking for with the schedule, yeah, that we could maybe we can find a way to not provide the schedule but give you the answer if that makes sense. Um, we are trying to work around effectively. We'll get as much information as you can that um, that the the uh, company is comfortable in providing us, and then I'll see if that's sufficient for our for our needs. So let's let's work on that. Get as much as you can that, with the recognition that it's. It's a public document. Absolutely. Um, the next question was, what happens to the battery energy storage system after it hit its 20 year mark? I think you went through that. There are various options and it depends on the degradation of the batteries. Is that correct? Or is there a plan for something after 20 years? Um, at this time, we tentatively are assuming we will repower after 20 years and replace the battery units. Um, but again, it depends on number of factors, market conditions at the time, like both from the electricity market and also the what batteries are available. Um, but right now we are assuming we will repower and replace the batteries, but again, we, we may not. Um, will Blue Wave be owning or running the site immediately after the BESS is operational and will continue to run the site um, 20, 30, and 40 years on? What's your Hard to, hard to predict, but what's your business plan? Sure, our business plan is to own and operate these projects for their entire lifetime. Um, it obviously, as you mentioned, 30, 40 years, good things could change, but our intent would be to operate them long term. Um, the next, the next, I would, would also welcome comments from our, the captain 
of our fire department if he has any uh, follow up on any of the emergency plans um, that we're that we are going to dive in. We'll be responding on site emergency or maintenance issues. Um, can you typically with with many projects we require you know sort of a contact person uh, information about who is going to be who's going to respond. We do that for a whole host of applications we receive. How can you put what information can you give us? Is it possible to give us um, regarding contact information for site or maintenance issues? Sure. So um, we can certainly provide a primary point of contact at this time from Blue Wave in regard to who would respond to any you know outreach or an event um, that occurs at a site. Um, right now, that's Tim Kelly, who's our director of asset management. Um, I'll I'll follow up with his contact information. Um, in terms of technicians, uh, we'll likely look to contract out to a third party group that does regional uh, servicing that's approved for this, this final system that we're utilizing. Um, so we are happy with, you know, it, it might be difficult to provide, say, prior to a board's decision, but we are more than happy with the condition that, you know, we have to provide that prior to any building permit issuance. Uh, and it has to be confirmed by both the board and, um, and uh, the fire department. Yeah, I, I don't think we need the name. We're not asking for the name of the individual um, warrant person who's doing maintenance, but the company, in this case, the company that's that's doing it. And then if it changes, to update the plan. Okay. Yeah, we can provide yep. yep. a potential company that we might partner with. And then, yeah, if it changes, we would, we would of course, update that. We have to update the plan. Okay. Um, does the fire department have any comment on that? At this time, Blue Wave has been very responsive um, throughout the whole process. They've, you know, had a couple meetings. Uh, first meeting, they just reached straight out to us um, and introduced the project to us. Um, we've gone back and forth a couple of times on the operation management plan, emergency response plan. They got me the copy of the uh, UL 9540A testing within days after I asked for it. So uh, I'm not at this time. Like I said, every question I've had up to this point, they've answered it extremely quickly and it's been appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Chief Prescom. Um, speaking of fire departments, have you been in contact with Sunderland? And, and maybe, Captain, you can talk to us about whether it's um, important. Would it be normal for them to also be in contact with the Sunderland Fire Department? Do you take the lead and do you contact the Sunderland Fire Department to make sure that everybody's uh, coordinated here? Or how does that work in terms of the best way to make sure that both agencies are in in the loop here i'm sure that you take the lead but send it on close yeah no absolutely because it is is it in amherst we would take the lead on that um but if blue wave was willing to include sunderland or the board wanted to include that as a uh, stipulation then we'd be happy to include sunderland with the training since as we all know it sits right on the border it, it abuts the border um of, of the town so yeah um the original response plan, I think there was a little confusion, but it got updated to the state that Amherst was the responding agency. But um, it looks like initially Blue Wave was going to include Sunderland anyway. So um, I think that is absolutely something we should look to do in the future going forward. So as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to take this and, you know, render my judgment on top of yours. So it sounds like you'd be, a, you think it's a good idea. So maybe that's something that we can, a condition that we can uh, impose. Um, there was a question about was there a second exit or egress point on site? Now, I, I think that's referring to outside the sound barrier. I think that's the question that was asked and you answered that second site about, uh, you know, at the other corner of the, of the sound barrier. But if the person that had that question um, wants to clarify it, this would be the time to do that. That it was, um, I, yeah, I asked yep. that. Yeah, an exit for personnel inside if there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. And so you saw that they have one down at the, they have a second exit at the far end in the corner. Yes, so that's, that's okay. fine. Yep. Uh, will the well on the existing property, be, the existing well on the property be capped or how will you deal with that? And what, what did you, the CONCOM say to you about that? 
Sure, yeah, we did have a direct discussion uh, on that with the CONCOM. Um, it wasn't noted or as a point of discussion on our site visit, but we will look to, to fill and cap that um, and we'll likely coordinate with the, uh, the health department um, just to confirm that that's been done as well as the conservation commission. Okay. And that the next is on stormwater, and this might be a good opportunity for for you to pull up. Maybe it's on here, but one of the questions is about the the stormwater lines, the drains, and um, can you run th run through that in more detail? This is a better better um, uh, rendering than we had in the, in your initial presentation, so that would be helpful to go through the stormwater mitigation that you've designed. Sure. Um, Drew, I know I'm sharing the plan, but do you want to, while I have the plan, do you want to describe again in uh, kind of detail based on what we're seeing right now? Yep. Can everyone still hear me? Yep. Again, Drew Vardakis, uh, civil engineer from WSP. So yeah, it's it's hard to see on this plan. There's a lot of lines going on, but essentially what's going yeah. on is, is each row of battery pads has a drain line that's connecting them. So they're demarcated with the letter D in a line. So Josh is running the mouse there basically mm -hmm. um, each I described earlier each set of battery pads um, battery enclosures sits on a concrete pad that has a concrete lip surrounding it and then out of that concrete pad there's a there's a dra uh, drain pipe that goes down under underground and those are all collected um, in those lines the D lines the drain lines so each row of ba of battery containers has a drain line that comes out, uh, drain going underground, and all collects into those. There's two there's two water underground water tanks, one at the southern end there, right next to his cursor, and one at one at the northern end. Okay. Then, as Drew mentioned, <laughs> those will drain to these uh, basically these infiltration trench uh, trenches that run along the perimeter of the site. And Although the water runs into the trenches runs along where the uh, plantings is? Is that what you're talking about along the plantings? Correct. So there's a slightly wider trench here with my cursor. That's just on the interior of the sound wall and it will overlap a little here at the end. And then there's a smaller or narrower trench here along the access road uh, as well. So I see. Kind of so yeah, so that's where uh, the, so the two you can see here, the this holding tank will drain to this trench and then this one mm -hmm. trench. All other stormwater that falls between the pads or anywhere else on site will just drain, will infiltrate where it falls and also kind of flow and drain naturally uh, based on the system contours. Yeah, and Josh, I'll just add on to that. Um, if, if you don't have it, uh, it's on sheet five, but it's the detail sheets of the drawing set. So there's a detail 14 that shows a, a rendering of basically what we're describing. It's, it's not to scale, but it basically shows uh, right yeah. in the center, center up top there. Yeah, so you see the the concrete pad with the footing. There's a, there's a pipe that goes down underneath the 12 inch PVC drain line goes to that tank, and then that tank it pumps water out to to the infiltration trench. So basically, what we just described on the plan is shown there in a cross sectional view. And so even in the hundred year, so in the hundred year event, which we have more often than every hundred years now, it seems. 100 year event, those I suspect those um, drainage ditches will fill up. Right. We design, we design our, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We design our stormwater VMPs uh, in our stormwater modeling. We design everything to the 100 year storm. And so, where does it, and then it ends up in the, um, the uh, uh, Department of Transportation um, French drain or whatever that is, uh, just cross hatch. No, the infiltration trenches are sized to to accommodate the hundred year storm. So they're there. Okay. We, we with our what I described before with our pre development and post development calculations, the post development calculations yep. have less runoff than the pre pre existing conditions. So those trenches are wide enough and deep enough to accommodate that exceedance in, in water due to the pads. And so that flood compens compensatory flood storage area would just remain or you may you may change it or what is it is that, uh, right. that doesn't figure into your plans at all right let me touch on that that is less for stormwater and more for the, what josh described in the the flood zone elevation so we added that compensatory flood storage elevation because we were working in the flood elevation 
Uh, however, like Josh said, uh, back and forth with the CONCOM, what was on the FEMA maps and what the town of Amherst is now going to change that elevation. We were we had that square footage of work occurring in the flood zone. So essentially, we were setting aside that square footage and volume of area to compensate the work that was occurring in the flood zone. Okay. Questions, uh, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, one question that um, the Wetlands Administrator Aaron did have that I just remembered, it pertains to the equipment pads at the top. So the six equipment pads, um, do you plan on including drainage into each of those pads? And if so, how do you plan on doing that? And would you be able to include that on a supplemental update to the site plan? Thank you. Uh, Blue, yeah, Josh, you wanna take that? Yeah, yeah I can take that. Um, so we, and we can clarify this with Aaron as well um, and the CONCOM separately, but um, the drainage, these drainage lines leading to these horn tanks was uh, primarily a result of the discussion with the CONCOM surrounding the batteries and, uh, you know, and kind of an abundance of caution against any potential concerns over, you know, any kind of leakage from the batteries themselves. The, the only equipment on the pads that's going to be present is, are these, these six pads up at the top of the system are going to be the inverters, transformers, and any other switch here. Um, the transformers, we are uh, planning to spec with a uh, non-toxic biodegradable dielectric fluid. So there's really no, from our perspective, there is no concern uh, from uh, any kind of, you know, fluid or contaminant present on these pads that would you would need to contain. And uh, again, that's what's really the primary intent behind these drainage lines this one tank and some pump system so these pads would remain unlipped water that falls on that equipment pad would sheet off and, and drain naturally um and again that that's that's because we where we don't have a concern or we don't identify concern for any uh any potential infiltration of say a, a fluid or fluid and again we can happy to reach out to Erin and, and clarify that with her and make sure she's in agreement Um, uh, Mr. Meadows. Uh, uh at, at this point, I'd like to, uh, ask if they could possibly use pollinators for their plantings. Um, yes, that's, a, mm -hmm. yeah, Mr. Meadows, sorry, you said pollinators for the plantings. Yep. Yep. Plants Absolutely. that attract pollinators. Sure. Yeah, we do. Um, we have a species list uh, on our plantains and we're happy to make, you know, we'll double check and make sure that that includes pollinators. If it doesn't, we'll absolutely uh, include some species. Thank you. Well, we have, a, I guess that raises a question um, that I had and I'll ask now. Um, we had a list of the plants around the uh, sound wall. We, do we have, did you, do you have a landscape plan generally for the other areas? I'm assuming that you're going to, do some landscaping around the beyond the, the sound wall. Um, what is are these plantings for privacy borders? What that's yeah, correct. Or yeah, press what are privacy. those? Privacy might be a little bit same, more just like visual landscaping and aesthetic landscaping. So these plantings would, and I'll scroll back up um, to the proposed conditions. Um, so these you can see here are these along the northern boundary is a row here and then along the southern so there is i mean two degrees privacy from a perspective of we wanted to provide some plantings to the northern abutter and the southern abutter here um just in terms of providing some vegetative uh buffer between the property line and the wall um in terms of landscaping elsewhere on the site um really so obviously this or i should say obviously but um, as was mentioned uh, this eastern side portion of the site um, has had some active farming on it, and yeah. our yeah. be that much to not not bother that. Um, mm -hmm. Areas more toward the front of the property, um, we might you know we might keep them mowed down occasionally if it presents. So you know, say maybe the from a drainage perspective, or just making sure the access road and general areas is uh, clean for for maintenance and personnel access, but. Generally, we wouldn't propose anything else, uh, just mainly because we're not disturbing or planning to disturb any of these soils or or this uh, this any existing vegetation in these areas. Okay.
So holding tanks, or the I think you asked of where the, does the water go after it gets to the holding Mr. tanks. Mr. Chair. Oh, excuse me. Ms. Marshall, yes, go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. I have a question about this water management. I, um, and I have to keep reminding myself that this interior area is is gravel where where there are not yeah. where there's not equipment there's gravel so i don't understand what's being drained is it some catastrophic leak of the batteries if they're even i don't even know if it's a liquid system but what's what's being drained and captured in these d yeah, yeah thanks yeah no no that's a great question i apologize for not uh clarifying that earlier um so um, you'll have the, uh, so each of the, there's obviously the, they call it I'll zoom in a lot here. Um, so these solid white rectangles, each of these represents one storage unit. And then this kind of dotted exterior rectangle, that's the actual pad. So um, the drainage is, so the, the, and speaking with the Conservation Commission and working with them, the concern was containment over uh, potential, mainly electrolyte within the battery cells, if that has a potential leak and and contain that in the normal course of operation, mainly because we don't ever expect, we don't expect any electrolyte to ever, you know, in material amounts leak out of the cells or much less in the enclosures. But so in the normal course in, in operation of the system, it's basically just the water that falls on the edge of these pads or falls on the container rooftop or the container tops and sheets off or on the actual lip of the pad itself, that water. So it's mostly just storm water. Um, and the pump system is so that we can ensure that that water will continue out and infiltrate into these trenches. And in the event there is an alarm or any kind of potential leak detected, those sump pumps will shut off. And um, anything that's coming out of anything that's, if it happens to be raining, it would also contain that, but it would contain anything that's coming off of these pads. And that would be disposed of as hazardous waste or some other? Would, yeah. That would trigger a, a hazmat response in coordination with the state. And we would, yeah, we would make sure if there's obviously double check to ensure that there wasn't any, you know, potential exposure to the soils. And if there was, we would, we would obviously remediate that um, immediately. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Wachula. Cool. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so follow-up question to that. Are you planning on putting any sort of like alarm system in the tanks themselves? So say if the sub pumps were to fail and the tanks overflew, you could be alerted to that in any way so you don't flow back up through the, the drainage pipes? Yeah, great question. So um, yes, we would, we would look for to install some kind of monitor or alarm to know the status of the sub pumps. So we, we're going to have to um, uh, tie basically the monitoring the systems anyway to the pumps so that if because what we want is we want the pumps to shut off um if there's any like fire alarm or just any any kind of condition that's triggered within any of the enclosures we want to go ahead as a fail safe and shut those pumps off so we'll tie that in and there will be some monitoring on those pumps to make sure so even if there's the all the battery enclosures are operating fine there's no concerns if there's a failure in the pump we would know about that and we can respond thank you Um, one of the questions on site was what level of protection does the sound barrier provide from intruders, wild animals, et cetera? Uh, I guess, can you just, just describe what your intent is with that, with the sound barrier, the 16 foot, uh, not fence, but barrier? Sure. So, um, and I, I think referencing the visual renderings helps as well with this, but it would be, um, so flush with the ground. Uh, again, 16 feet high, typically we're expecting somewhere between a four to six inch width barrier. Um, barrier materials can vary for these types of sites where we're um, anticipating inspecting is um, effectively, again, four to six inch thick, uh, like sandwich construction. So it'll be metal panels sandwiching a, some you know, sound damping material. Um, that again would go around the entire perimeter of the site. Gates would also be designed into that sound wall. So there's that's to ensure that there's no um, no gap in sound transmission. So from a perspective of wild animals, just general intruders, um, it would be in order to kind of get into the site, you would have to climb over that sound wall when it's locked up. So um, from a mitigation perspective, we kind of view that pretty highly in terms of providing a significant barrier. Um, 
Uh, and then again, those both access gates would be locked at all times. There would be a Knox box that the fire department, police department could access um, if they need to, but otherwise um, there wouldn't be any unauthorized access. I know, Ms. Marshall, you had this question on the site visit. Do you have a follow-up? Um, yes, and I'll, I, I hope we'll have a larger discussion of security, but I'm wondering, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is right by a highway, and I'm wondering how, if this sound barrier is strong enough to um, not be destroyed if some vehicle comes flying off the, the road, either intentionally or not intentionally. I, if it, it seems to be designed to mitigate the sound and not actually so much protect the site. So do you have any comment about how physically strong it is? Sure, so um, I don't wanna speak without knowing exactly, you know, we could certainly, once we're at a point where we're working with the, the barrier manufacturer and there, there would be various details on that design in terms of structural integrity. Um, most of that's gonna be calculated from say like a wind load perspective, um, you know, to pay, especially with the slightly higher wall. Um, you're going to want to make sure that that wall will stand up to any wind loads top of the wall. Um, so there would be, it likely will be a post and panel um, manufacturing, so driven post um, with the panels attached kind of slotted in between. Um, in terms of, uh, imp you know, impeding a, a vehicle, again, I, I don't want to, certainly it would provide a measure of impedance. Um, there's also, you know, a degree of setback from the road. So um, I can get the exact distance of, it might not be, I don't know if it's depicted on the plans, but um, certainly we, you know, we wouldn't expect a car or, you know, any event of a car impacting the wall, it, it likely would be impacting an angle or potentially we'll just avoid the wall at all. If, if it's going to go into the ditch first, um, it probably won't make it to the wall. Um, but uh, generally, again, I can't speak exactly to how much it would stand to a direct vehicle impact, but just based on the site conditions, we wouldn't expect or expect the likelihood of any kind of direct vehicle impact um, at a high speed, say directly into the wall would be would be highly unlikely. Um, if the board would like to see, you know, potential additional considerations, we could consider something like installing some bollards along the, the front of the wall, um, you know, spaced out. Uh, they could kind of blend into the maybe the vegetation management, um, and that could, you know, provide also an additional uh, measure of, of uh, impedance to vehicles. Yeah, I, I would be in favor of bollards or something. I mean, we have to we we have to consider the possibility that somebody would deliberately drive a vehicle at high speed into the wall. So, Ms. So, Prestrup, you had your oh, go ahead. No, no, that, that's, that's enough off. for now. I but again, yep. there'll be other security issues. <laughs> so Ms. I just uh, wanted to. Ms. Prestrup, yep. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. thinking of those barriers that they have along the highway in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, those are sound barriers that protect neighborhoods, but I imagine those are designed to protect the neighborhood from a truck flying off the highway too. So I just wondered if that would be um, something that you might consider here, that type of barrier. Yeah, or potentially, I, I know there's a lot of highway barriers we've observed that are might be concrete construction or might be thicker in nature and um, obviously trying to limit um, in general just the amount of impact on the site you know it, something that's less imposing visually than say like a, a highway concrete barrier um, like I said I think we're happy to explore multiple options when it comes to the sound barrier um, and again we could I think we could you know talk with the manufacturer um, and the, the the engineer who will design the foundation and the the do the calculations on the structural loads for the, the barrier. Um, um, if we can work with them to assess potential vehicle impact and if the barrier would be suitable for preventing that, um, we'll do that. And then again, if if, if there's indication that they, you know, they'd say, well, you know, if we're trying to address the concern of something deliberately driving directly into it, then if we need something like bollards, again, we could explore that option as well. Thank you. And Mr. Lara, see you. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Presto, finish no. up. Um, so I, how soon will you, will you have that information, will you make that decision on uh, identifying a manufacturer or a vendor for the sound barrier? And when, when would we see, would you, do you anticipate 
that being revealed to us before you would ask for a positive vote on your application. Many times we'd want to see the, uh, sometimes yes. we want to, see, I might want to see the uh, design before we approve the project. So what's your timeline for that? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we weren't intending uh, or planning to uh -huh. have that, that level of design ready prior to requesting a decision. Um, typically we would look to incorporate that just because those structural load designs mm -hmm. uh, in terms of let's say a percentage are typically gonna be 60% design or greater, like much closer to construction. Um, again, we're happy to, to reach out maybe to manufacturer and, and get as much information as we can at this time, but I think it'd be difficult to maybe move at this time to um, say a more advanced, like 60% or greater design. But you do have a, but you have, you have a vendor in mind. Um, not this time. I know we did provide a representative material and, and, uh, manufacturer that we might look to, to at least, uh, you know, solicit a quote from for their, their barrier. Um, so that, that example I provided likely would be a company, one, one such company we reach out to, um, again, it, and, you know, I'm happy to maybe try to get some more information if, that that country might not have, uh, from them in terms of typical, like a typical design, maybe like I could try to reach out to them for a typical barrier design or, or from an engineering drawing perspective. Um, it just, again, may not be specifically designed to the site just yet, but, um, something that's representative. That might be helpful. And that's up to the sort of the will of the board as to how specific they want to be on the design of the project. Mr. Meadows. Um, two things. Uh, one, in that same regard, you might think about the fact that there's a utility substation, not more than a few hundred yards down the road, which is a much more likely target for anything. Um, I, I can't imagine that anybody's going to care about this in comparison. Secondly, um, depending upon the degradation schedule, it seems as though you're probably going to have a, you, a contract, a 20 year contract with the utility company to provide the 70, approximately 75 and a half megawatt hours. Um, and that will need to be kept up during that whole period of time. Uh, at the end of the 20 years, you still then got a life cycle for the, the equipment. Um, and you, at that point, I'm sure have got a choice between selling it to someone else or retaining it for a period of time before you uh, do anything else with it. Uh, if there's a transfer in title, I would assume that we're going to have to look at it again. Is that not true, Mr. Chairman? Yes. And I would think that that'd be a condition that we would impose on the, it was one of the questions I would, I was going to ask Mr. Meadows is, what happens and I'm going to suggest a condition that we review the um the special permit on change of ownership very good i think a lot of these next a lot of these next questions mr laracy you've answered um or or they are contained in the um the management plan that i that I, to the extent i've read it um the site is not going to have lighting that's correct yeah, right now, just, you don't plan to have lighting, okay? Sure. Um, and there, you don't plan to have um, uh, cameras present on the site, do you? We haven't uh, proposed that at the time, but I would say for both lighting and cameras, if the board has feels that that would provide also additional measure security, um, we, we can add that into the design, incorporate um, you know some lighting locations and you know locations for proposed cameras. Okay, thank you. Um, you have a maintenance schedule, a maintenance schedule in your operating plan for a host of things, everything from safety as well as it looks like um, landscaping. So I think if board members could look at that. But generally, there's you have annual, um, quarterly, monthly um, maintenance schedules, and also this, you have some um, landscaping maintenance kinds of things that are required. Um, so you have that contained in your operating plan. Um, we talked about. Well, I guess we didn't actually talk about attacks on energy facilities. Have you experienced that? Any, any, have your, has your company experienced or um, in the past an attack on an energy facility or uh, something that you or have, have owned? Sure. So we, Bluehead personally, has not experienced any attacks um, on any of the systems we developed. Um, certainly none that we're aware of. Um, and we haven't you know, heard from any, say, uh, 
other you know similar developers who work in the space um, that they've had any issues with with their systems. Um, uh, so no, we, we haven't experienced that. Um, I, yeah, as as the board has mentioned, you know there were, there have been some recent ones on some substations, but most recently I believe in North Carolina. Um, but we have not experienced any of those. Uh, Ms. Parks, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to ask for the other projects that you have done. Um, is this the kind of fencing that you've used? The the it is, I mean, do you already have fencing like this, sixteen foot high fencing on other projects? Sure, good question. So we haven't incorporated this typically on any projects in the past. So. Um, all the products we have energy storage on today have been co-located with solar. This is among the first that would be on a standalone basis. Most of those products with solar and storage co-located. Um, the storage is typically much smaller in size um, since it's DC coupled and it's typically taking off excess energy from the solar. And then just due to the nature of the solar development, typically we can we can locate that energy storage um, in the more of the interior of the array and it's typically a, a large pixel. So, basically much more set back from property lines um, and uh, usually less concerns or no concern over um, sound mitigation. Okay, so is this your largest project? Um, this is the largest project we're looking to develop. Um, it's, I would say maybe at the distribution scale size, but typically, you know, we do have a number of say five to 20 megawatt projects that we're looking to develop. Um, they're all, you know, given just the density of energy storage or where it's gotten to. Um, you know, they don't vary in physical size that much. Generally, we're talking, you know, a quarter of an acre to an acre and a half of space. Um, and that covers generally the five to 20 megawatt range. Okay, thank you. Ms. Marshall. Thank you. Um, I have a bunch, some, some littles. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be pedantic, just accurate. Um, in your O&M plan, I, and I saw it earlier, um, biannual means every two years. You may mean semi-annual, which is every six months. So I just flag that. Um, can we get updated renderings? Because I don't think the renderings match the, the site plan that we're looking at right now. Um, uh, thirdly, if I understand, you understood what you said about adding batteries over time, that suggests that the facility will be noisier over time. Um, I assume your modeling uh, uses the full build out, but you said you'd be doing sound testing uh, when you start operating. But again, that'll be with a, you know, much, not the complete built out um, battery array. So will you be doing more sound testing as you add battery units? Maybe you can address that. And I, then I think I have, well, that's, uh, those are most of my questions. So thanks. Sure. Uh, no, thank you for the questions. Um, just address in turn. Yeah, well, I'll check on the o &M plan by and over semi-annual and make sure any references there are correct to the maintenance being specified. Um, renderings, I, as uh, earlier discussion, I think the, I believe the renderings are, are, are pretty accurate. The only discrepancy might be just in showcase some of the electrical poles. So we'll double check those and I'll, we'll go back and make sure that any renderings are fully correct, but the current rendering should be, call it, you know, 95% correct apart from those, or 100% correct apart from the poles. And possibly I still don't understand from this, this drawing here, where is the wall? <laughs> is like, is this gravel road inside or outside the wall? Maybe I'm just misunderstanding. No, no, no worries. Um, and sorry, your your uh, first. I'll just address your your last question. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, you're correct. So our sound analysis does take into consideration all units that would be installed at in the future. So all. Um, not just the ones that would be installed day one, but the 34 plus the 17. So all of those units combined. Um, so we're mitigating, we are mitigating to the eventual scenario where we have all of them. Um, and then, yeah, the, the sound measurements, I mean, that's, we would pretty much defer to the board in terms of um, 
you know, if they, if they want to see ongoing measurement or say measurements when certain units are added to ensure ongoing compliance, um, that is something we, we could do. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if the board wants to see something uh, or, you know, condition that as a firm approval. Um, and then, yeah, on the plan, so I apologize if it's clear, but this uh, single black line with the intermittent squares, that represents the, the sound barrier line. So um, so the, the access road does come in kind of along the front of it and then just continues underneath it. Um, but then once it's within the site, the section of the access road is within fully within the barrier here. Okay, thank you. All right, I, I, I withdraw my criticism of the rendering of thing. Mr. Wachella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I do have a question pertaining to uh, removal of snow, snow storage, and um, accessing between each of the battery units on site. So um, just to get an idea in terms of snow removal, you didn't really specify too much in terms of what areas of the site are going to be removed. It seemed like you're only going to do just the access road outside and within the site. You do have those two snow storage areas shown in the hyphenated lines, but I had a question pertaining to whether or not you're going to go be above and beyond that. Like, do you think you would have to remove any snow in between the battery units? And then kind of a follow-up question to that. In terms of getting to each of those battery units, are you going to have technicians walking through them? Are you going to try to fit a vehicle through there? Like, what's your plan for getting access to each of those units on the site? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. So um, in terms of snow removal, yeah, so you're correct. We do have these these potential uh, snow stockpiling areas for removal. Um, that that would be any snow from both the access road, but also you know you could utilize this interior location for snow within the system. Um, I would say we wouldn't necessarily uh, in a snow event we wouldn't necessarily look to always remove the snow from the interior between the battery enclosures unless it presented you know and if there was a significant enough snowfall that could present a potential obstruction to say responding to an event emergency event or um, performing any maintenance, then we would we would have someone go out and uh, and also remove the snow or move the snow from uh, from within the the battery enclosure themselves. For the access road, we would you know likely use a utility pickup truck with a plow for the road um, within the units. So the we wouldn't there's no intent to drive any um, large vehicles, say large being, being utility pickup or larger within the between or within the enclosures. Um, uh, so it likely would be personnel going through, you know, with snow blowers or some smaller equipment um, by hand, kind of going through and removing snow uh, to any to a suitable stockpile location. Um, and then additionally, kind of again related to that, um, the only vehicles we anticipate uh, being operated between the enclosures would be something like a forklift. If, if there was an event where, say, a battery, a set of cells, or a battery rack needed to be replaced. Um, then the containers are spaced out so the doors swing open on the long sides um, and a forklift could kind of come down, uh, turn, kind of come in, pull out a rack, uh, take it off site or take it out and replace it. Um, but other than that, there wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't have any other vehicles driving. And in terms of the storage tanks, um, do you have any specifications or calculations on the, on the load they can withstand? So say if you were to take a forklift and drive directly over one of those tanks, do you know the capacity of what those tanks can hold or at least um, what weight can be supported? Sure, so we haven't done at this time, you know, at this point in the design, we haven't done detailed calculations on that. Um, that's certainly something we can do prior to construction. And I mean, generally right now at the depth, the depth the tanks being buried at, um, Combined with the fact that forklift, um, we could also, you know, if, if needed, we could spec, um, you know, low ground pressure units, um, say to have, you know, 10 psi, 7 psi or less. Um, we don't anticipate any, or uh, we don't anticipate any issues with structural integrity for the tanks, um, but certainly, you know, we can provide confirmation of that, and we'll we'll want to confirm that on our end prior to construction. Thank you. But you, you would not be opposed to having a condition saying that you have to provide that um, before um, you can use, you have to provide um, measurements or certification that it can stand the uh, press, pressure of an, a vehicle um, 
prior to occupancy or uh, getting a building permit. I'm uh, not sure that we, I'm, I don't know that we need to know it right now, but maybe okay. we need to know something before it got, um, before you started to use it or can start a construction. Yeah, we wouldn't be opposed to that condition. Okay, so we have that information. Ms. Parks. Um, I just have a, a couple of random questions, but one of them is, mm -hmm. um, so you're going to have um, 17 additional units potentially installed in the future. Will the pads be installed uh, when the project, if the project goes forward? So there wouldn't, so the pads would all be, so all the construction would be done, but then you'd still need to have a forklift to go in to bring in new batteries. Is that right? Yeah, good question. So um, that's correct. So we would we would put the pads in um, in order to install the batteries. Um, yeah, you'd either we'd either check to see if you know we'd either have a forklift come in um, uh, for the battery acts themselves. Likely, what would happen is we'd have a um, uh, kind of a small call it a crane that would come in. So it wouldn't go within the enclosure, but it'd be kind of just to the side of it in this area, staging area. Um, those would likely lift and place in the actual enclosures. Uh, and then if they're not already fully loaded, and then if they, they aren't fully loaded, then we would likely come in with the forklift and install the, the packs themselves within the enclosure. Uh, so though, so we, again, we would likely install the, or we'd look to install the pads day one, but come in later and kind of put, put into place those enclosures at a later day. All right, thanks. And then I have um, a question. So is the, is the sound only, uh, the, is the only sound generated from fans cooling the batteries? Uh, that's in regard to the battery enclosures. That's correct. It's only fan noise, and then there's additional noise produced by the inverters, uh, which will have like a slight hum to them. So those two are the when we model this when our consultant models the sound analysis. Those are the two primary uh, sound sources they model. All right, and the the additional three telephone poles that I guess would be Eversource's poles. Do those create any sound? Uh, no, those don't create any sound. Okay. Um, is there a fire hydrant close by the property? So the closest fire hydrant is um, up Sunderland Road. It's actually in Sunderland um, near the solar project that's to the north, uh, northwest. Um, I want to say, um, I have to go back. I, I believe we specify in our, our initial application the distance. Um, I, I want to say around 600 feet up the road. Um, that might, or I'd have to double check, but there, the closest one is up Sunderland Road uh, near that solar project. Okay. Um, and you had talked about if uh, additional sound reduction was required, that you would do something. What what would you do? It, would that be an additional fence or something? What would that look like? Sure. So in all likelihood, it would mean we would have to probably further restrict operation of the units. Um, so that they, so we would, we would look to just reduce the noise generated, um, especially if, of course, if the sound barrier is installed, um, you know, replacing it with something would be likely costly. You also kind of do get diminishing returns with say like going for a taller wall. So it would likely again, just be um, reducing, yeah, reducing sound at the source by restricting operations or exploring, you know, maybe other options, uh, maybe even potentially sound mitigation much closer to the units if that's feasible, but likely reducing operations. All right, and just uh, one other random question is the, do the batteries have to be white? And the reason I'm asking that is because when we went to the site, there were houses that were up a hill above it, meaning that their view will be the top of this rather than the side. Sure, yeah, um, we can certainly check with Canadian Solar. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, the enclosures are typically a white or say more neutral cream beige color that for thermal management. So typically just to reflect more sunlight and that reduces the cooling load needed on the system, which would also keep fan, fans lower and fan noise down. Um, we could see if it's if it's feasible or you know, based on the the expected ambient temperature conditions, if if we could make it another color. Um, Certainly, the wall we could we could look to to make another color, um, not not necessarily a white or a gray, but we, we can look into it. I just don't want to say definitively if we could, just because again those post thermal management uh, concerns do come into play. 
Yeah, no, I understand. I just, uh, from the perspective of the people up the hill, I, it would just be less annoying. But you know, if it's it's a, if it's for uh, absorb, you know, sun absorption, um, then I understand. Um, if if I can just throw out, I have a, if there is a preference for wall color, I would have it be a dark green color so that it more blends in with the uh, background and the rural nature in that area. And that's it for me. Thank you. One of the things I'd like to do is just, uh, as long as we have Captain um, Bascom here, I don't want to keep him longer than he has to stay because he probably has other things um, more urgent than this on his plate. But I would like to see if he has any comments or any questions. I'd like to talk, kind of focus on the uh, emergency response if we have questions about that while the captain is here. And Captain Baskin, are you still here or did you have to leave? Or did he have to leave? He can't answer. <laughs> he can't answer us if he's not here. <laughs> I think he's left. I think he's left. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we can follow back with him. But it, it, um, I guess one of the things is there's a the first question I have on that regard, Mr. Laracy, is that there's a lot of the emergency response plan and a lot of the um, back and forth with the fire department and the police department that's um, to be included later or TBD, and it hasn't been, it hasn't been fleshed out yet, um, is that may be, I think that would be important to see, have, have those things finalized before we take a look at it and um, for the, um, for the, to vote on the special permit application. Uh, when I went through the, the emergency management plan, I noticed that there was either it's not up, it's not currently um, up to date, or you just have to make some decisions about what what you're going to do in cases of uh, responses. So like um, when I look at section, I guess it's section three of your emergency response plan, um, central monitoring, remote networking, emergency shutoffs, site, line, uh, site level e-stops, exposure level stops. Uh, I guess those are all things that you'd have a some kind of a trigger to, I mean, those are examples of, of incidents where you would have a trigger to measure when you have to take a certain action or something. And I just wondered why those are not I do wonder why those are not specified in your, your emergency response plan. Sure, so um, yeah, first I would just say that some of those items we wouldn't, we wouldn't have yet finalized or look to finalize, um, just depending on, you know, we do try to maintain just as we're working through the general development process, um, flexibility in terms of uh, equipment and also layout. So as we work, so first I would say as we work through permitting, um, the project town, you know, town board, such as yourself, might have feedback on the way a layout, you know, design, maybe adding or taking away or moving things around. So that could affect staging areas or uh, muster points, various aspects like that. Um, additionally, there are some, some maybe more technical aspects specific to the equipment. Um, we could certainly add it now. Um, and then, of course, if, if there was an equipment change um, down the road, we would, you know, have to provide not only the updated specifications for any change in equipment, but obviously change, update the ERP to reflect um, that change in equipment. But we were happy to go back, um, review the ERP with the SRG, um, and add in, you know, anything additional at this time. We were mainly, again, just waiting, uh, just just so that um, we don't have to go through more iterations if we mm -hmm. finalize things. Um, and say there's an equipment change, we would need to go back. But if, if the board wants to see that, we can do that now. And then just if there's a change, we'll we'll deal with it then. Well, aside from Mr. Meadows, I don't. I suspect most of us <laughs> don't have any comprehension of what those things are. But I tend to rely upon the judgment of the fire department or emergency response departments to make sure they that they are they are are uh, comfortable with what you're proposing and that it's uh, that it's consistent with that. And I would think that that's something you'd want to have done prior to finalizing the the project application but um i think that that would we, we'd have to rely upon the judgment of the of the uh, fire department and emergency services quite frankly for some of that stuff but i would like i would like to see it finalized with them before you go forward but um, i think mr meadows probably has more knowledge about this i know he has more knowledge about this than than i do and he may have an opinion about that um go ahead craig no i was simply going to say i'm not i'm not too concerned about it okay 
So, but you'd like to, you're not concerned about it not being specified before the application is considered? Correct. Okay. Um, Ms. Marshall. Um, so, uh, this, this is a, a unique project. Um, I've never, I mean, I've only been on, haven't been on ZBA for a year even, but there's a lot of blank wall here, especially when the plantings are new and they're small. And I can imagine that it might be an attractive graffiti opportunity for people who do that. So I, I just throw that out there. I don't know if, if the owner would want to come and cover it all up speedily or doesn't really care or whether the town would want to put a requirement on you know removing unsightly mm -hmm. or at least offensive graffiti so i don't know how likely it is but that's it's a lot of wall <laughs> a lot of blank wall so any thoughts someone might have i i, I could say if you go behind hastings there's yeah. <laughs> a really, really remarkable graffiti artist who now lives in town. Uh, he grew up here primarily and, and is extremely good. That is that is a remarkable wall behind Hastings. Uh, and it's been uh, and he, he updated it recently. So it's it's remarkable. Yeah. Um, I'd like to either Chris or Rob, or I'd like to stay on the emergency services subject right now or um if we can if your questions about that please go ahead it's not a question it's just a comment that um you can often create a condition that allows you to review something later on in other words approve a special permit but then have a condition that the applicant needs to come back with whatever the plan is in a final form before they receive their building permit so they do need a building permit for this and they need, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of other permits too, probably electrical permits, et cetera. But um, that might be something that could help you to deal with um, the possible inability of the applicant to come forward with a final version of whatever plan it is that you're looking for. I just wanted to make that yep. suggestion. And that, that can be submitted back either to us or sometimes to the building commissioner or the fire department if we choose. So that's a good, that's a good point. Rob? Uh, just to build on that, um, so the applicant, Mr. Laracy, actually suggested making it a condition that the final emergency response plan be reviewed and signed by both the police department and the fire department um, before issuance of a building permit. And that would be given to the planning department and to the building commissioner. Um, so uh, that might be the best strategy for this sort of thing, because it seems that the most important aspects of the ERP is um, public safety. And that includes both fire and police. And as long as they're okay with it, um, even yeah. after the board votes to approve it, that's that's the most important um, personnel that should be reviewing that specific plan. The one thing I, I agree with that. It seems to me that the one thing I don't know much about is how a lithium, how these lithium batteries create the create a problem, and what happens when it does when it does burn. Um, I know you talked about it. Um, I forget the term you use, but when they it's sort of like they they run away, uh, they, they they function too highly, and they then they create too much heat. So, have you, have you experienced that with that? I don't know. I don't want to call it a meltdown because that's that's I think really um, sensational. But have you experienced that with anything you've owned? And describe to us what the potential is for toxic chemicals or other things that would, or smoke that would happen and uh, air pollution that would happen if you did have one of those events in these, uh, in, in the battery storage or the BESSES, I guess is what you call them. Can you do that, Mr. Laracy? Yeah, happy to. Um, I'll just briefly touch this and then also if uh, Nick weren't still on the call, hand it to him uh, since he has witnessed and as part of testing fires of the system you know firsthand up, up close um so yeah as you as i mentioned 
can, the historically the conditions that could create a fire with lithium ion batteries is, is thermal runaway in, in the underlying battery cells. Um, as you mentioned, it's kind of a, a cascading effect that it could that has occurred in the past, um, where cells heat, basically heat up other cells and cause greater um, uh, greater thermal conditions overall in the unit. Um, the, and that's where I reference again in my presentation that he and, and Captain Bascom was right, right on the mark when he requested to see a copy of the UL 948 test report. Um, that report is critical for making sure that, um, again, with that report, they test the system at the unit level, so at the enclosure level, um, they'll check, they'll basically cause cells in thermal right away and see what happens uh, when a fire or thermal event is created. Um, so the expectation is that Due to the design, if, if as long as the system meet, meets those UL 948 or based on UL 948 testing, doesn't demonstrate propagation of thermal runaway from a module to module, and certainly a unit to unit level, um, that those you know any thermal conditions are going to be isolated to you know the container that is and the cells in the container that are having that issue. Um, the recommended response um, because of that, because of you know experience with firefighters and testing on these systems, the recommended response in the event of a thermal event or fire uh, is to effectively just monitor the system. Um, you know, most of the, the, you know, call it activity that happens and those sorts of events happens um, kind of in the first, um, uh, pretty soon after an event occurs, um, but it's to monitor the system. It, there wouldn't be large quantities of water applied to the system or, um, you know, the, the fire department would look to kind of monitor the site, make sure that the overall site conditions aren't causing a safety concern. Um, and we would, we would have personnel stay on site, at, you know, within, you know, hour, hours or even potentially days after an event to ensure that, um, you know, their conditions don't reemerge and that um, the site is fully remediated. But I'll definitely, again, Nick, Nick, if Nick's still on the call, I'll hand it to him yep. uh, so he can uh, elaborate. Yeah, I am still, Josh. Um, I, I, so uh, to start at the beginning, um, like you mentioned, uh, thermal runaway is a cell level event. The purpose of the 9548 testing is to show that a single cell failure is going to be limited in its propagation through the system. Uh, Canadian Solar with their Solbank system has demonstrated that single cell failure uh, does not propagate tremendously through the system. They have an exhaust system in the unit that is designed to vent uh, the gas that's released from the battery uh, as they're in thermal runaway. Um, and I guess for everyone's edification, um, a lithium ion battery cell, uh, in this case, each individual cell may be thought of as maybe a small shoebox. Uh, that cell by mass is going to be about 75 to 80% metals. Uh, it's got some very thin layers of plastic inside of it. And then the electrolyte is a hydrocarbon uh, similar to gasoline or uh, naphthalene or something along those lines. Um, so when thermal runaway occurs, what happens is that electrolyte, which is less than 20% of the mass of the individual cell, is converted into a gas which then escapes from the cell. Uh, in some instances, that gas can be ignited. And as you can imagine, uh, same as you have, same as if you had gasoline uh, that was pressurized and heated and then, you know, uh, evacuated from a space, uh, it will burn. What we mm -hmm. see with these particular chemistries and what 9548 testing showed is that single cell events uh, are not likely to result in ignition. You'll have emission of gas from one of these cells. Uh, a few hundred liters of gas. Uh, it should be ventilated from the system. And uh, if somebody were walking by, they may get a very faint smell of a, a unique odor because battery electrolyte is a little unique. <laughs> Generally, a single cell fire shouldn't be more than a, a very localized event. Uh, may not even be worth getting the fire department involved for. However, the fire department exists because things happen. If a greater scale failure were to occur, as Josh alluded to, uh, our guidance to the fire department, so long as there's not a life safety issue or property safety or something that you know we can't really fathom right now were to occur, uh, our guidance to the fire department is going to be passively manage the event. Um, if the battery is continuing to off gas, battery off gas can look like uh, smoke, but it's usually a, a heavy, lazy gas it can be managed very well with a, a fire hose on a fogging pattern. 
So our guidance to them would be, you know, knock down the gas cloud, uh, you know, no reason to for it to, you know, run across the neighborhood or anything. Uh, the wall is actually going to do a pretty good job of containing it, but the fire department should be able to effectively manage uh, what should normally be a very localized effect. Uh, there are a um, couple of specific weather conditions, usually between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit and very high humidity, where that gas can be a little lazier and uh, kind of linger a little more, but generally the gas is going to disperse probably within 100 to 150 feet of the site if not less than that, um, and not going to be an issue. If it is an issue, the fire department should be able to manage it. If the battery is burning, if it's fully involved, uh, generally lithium ion batteries, because they, the flammable material is primarily that liquefied hydrocarbon, they burn pretty hot, but they actually burn pretty clean. You should have a pretty clean white smoke uh, heading up into the air, and it, it shouldn't be other than a visible smoke plume shouldn't be any noticeable odors or anything, uh, you know, any kind of appreciable distance from the site. So we'll train the fire department as, as Josh uh, alluded to, but our general guidance does not call for any automatic evacuation or shelter in place. Uh, same as any structure fire, or commercial or utility fire, uh, you know, the fire department is, can and should monitor the area, if they see something that concerns them, you know, certainly that'll be their call to make, but we have not seen anything in our testing to date that suggests that uh, there's any tremendous toxicity risk or anything from batteries. Uh, what little bit of data we've generated suggests that in a lot of cases, they're comparable to structure fires, or in some cases may even be cleaner uh, burning than a potential structure fire. So um, again, it'll depend on weather conditions. It'll depend on you know, what exposures may be in the area, the weather conditions and things like that. But uh, those are all things that the fire department should be well-versed in and making decisions about for any fire. Uh, with respect to the runoff water, there's still research on going on that. Uh, there have been, there's one study that came out last month uh, comparing electric vehicles to gasoline powered vehicles, uh, not 100% an apples to apples comparison, but uh, maybe a, a red apples to green apples comparison, if you will, and uh, found that lithium ion batteries in some cases were cleaner or uh, contained less of, of some uh, constituents. In some cases, they contained a little more, but generally were comparable to a car fire uh, if you put a lot of water on the battery, and certainly if you flushed water directly through the battery. In our case, our guidance for the fire department is not going to be to directly attack the battery. Uh, we'll protect adjacent exposures. We'll put water up around the perimeter. Uh, if we have a, a gas cloud or if we have smoke that is uh, lingering, but we're not going to directly attack the battery. So we'll, uh, the intent will be to minimize the production of, of runoff water. There's a storm water system on site that's going to contain everything anyway. Um, and so we wouldn't expect any any tremendous environmental risk uh, between the research that's been done and the, the containment methods and suppression that we're going to advise on site. Thank you. So I, 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 what I take from that is that, and again, my judgment will be informed mostly by, by what you said, but also most importantly by the fire department and emergency services here in Amherst, but that the off-gassing tends not to be the kind of constituent elements and chemicals um, that would warrant some kind of uh, evacuation of, of, of uh, neighbors or uh, people in close proximity to the to the to the um, battery storage site is that correct that's our guidance and that's based on what we've seen in our large-scale fire testing it's not uncommon for us to have anywhere from five to 25 people uh, within 100 feet or 200 feet of batteries when they're on fire um, you know, ideally we don't stay, uh, we don't stand downwind of them, but uh, yeah. uh, we've been doing this and, for years. And what's released? What what does a fire, what's, what comes out in the air? Is it some um, oxidized form of lithium or what? I'm, I'm not sure what it would be. No, um, so the, the research that's been or done to date shows same as any uh, structure fire, predominantly okay. carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Uh, in some cases, we're looking at toxics like uh, hydrogen chloride or hydrogen fluoride, 
my personal experience with these with testing is that it's actually the quantity of plastics inside the unit that drive those toxic levels. So you can imagine with a modern structure, you know, you have flame retardant carpets, flame retardant couches, chemicals under the sink. Uh, all of those yeah. contain all manner of chlorides, fluorides, and other nasty stuff. Um, our experience with the batteries is it's usually how much plastic is in the thing that determines how much of some of those toxics are there. These systems are by mass 75 to 80% metal and steel. So um, we haven't seen, though admittedly we haven't looked for a lot of heavy metals in the gas because aren't, these aren't typically things that, uh, you know, float long distances. But uh, with respect to the, the gases themselves, we have not seen excessively high levels of any toxics or really even any other chemicals uh, beyond 150 feet. In most cases, that's usually about as far as we sample because that's usually the distance where you know, we get below detectable levels of anything. Thank you. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I have a question about this um, UL 9548 report. Um, I may have missed it, but I did not see any statement anywhere from the um, testing firm that the, the battery pack, battery rack met the standard. I mean, I'm inferring that it did, but I did. There's no, you know, sign off. Yes, met all met all the requirements of UL 9540A. So, uh, Josh, I can take that if you'd like. So, unlike most 90 UL standards, 9540A is not actually a pass fail test. It doesn't come. There's not a listing criteria. Um, if you look on the cover, it's actually referred to as a test method. Its purpose is to gather information for further engineering analyses. So uh, you do three levels of testing to generate explosion concerns or to generate the quantity of explosive gases that are released. And then that feeds into uh, an explosion study. You look at what kind of heat is released uh, during the, both during the testing and if there were a larger fire. That feeds into a heat flux analysis. Um, it's not like 1973, 95, 40 other UL standards, there's not a stamp that comes with it. So that may be why you didn't see uh, a pass fail there. That makes sense, thank you. Um, but were those further analyses done? Yes. That it feeds so, into the heat flux, you know, whatever. The, the heat <laughs> flux, um, I, I'm involved with the heat flux. I don't know how much I can say other than that's underway. Um, the, um, there's and for what it's worth, there's not a requirement uh, in the code for heat flux. That's just something that uh, some manufacturers have been doing. Uh, for with respect to the explosion analysis, um, I was not involved in that particular study. But NFPA 855 requires compliance with NFPA 69, uh, which is an explosion analysis that has been performed. So uh, there should be um, a document somewhere stamped by an engineer that. Uh, attests to the the analysis of that system. If, if I can ask one more, Mr. Chair. Um, yes. So, Go ahead, so if there's no pass fail, what is the context for assessing the degree of gas production? Is there, you know, compare this to other battery racks yeah. by so other you, uh, Yeah. So you you collect the the quantity and the composition of the gas that comes off. And then you feed that into explosion models. So uh, usually it's some kind of computational fluid dynamic software. You feed that release rate in there. Um, and then the computer builds a model of how that gas might disperse. And then also what the pressure of that gas would be if, if it were to combust. Uh, the way you typically do it, because the standard in the test, you typically only see a couple of cells fail. Like I said, uh, I believe for Canadian Solar's test, they had very limited propagation. What you end up doing in the analysis then is say, okay, I only lost two cells in the test. I'm gonna look at what happens if I lose 20 cells. And you scale that up to more extreme scenarios um, to make sure that your system does cover a, you know, all worst case potentials. And then that's uh, the approval for that comes by way of a uh, licensed engineer reviewing that analysis 
and stamping it um, same as you would a building or a bridge or anything else ultimately. Great. Thank you for that. Um, are there other questions regarding this application from members of the board or staff? Ms. Parks. So I'm just wondering if we heard anything from any of the abutters. No? I don't think we have. I don't think an abutter notice was was given to everybody with was it not rob every feet yeah so abutters in both amherst and sunderland were notified because the property touches the um 300 foot buffer goes into the sunderland town line so those abutters were also notified okay and i'm uh, back to the safety issue i'm assuming that if the battery heats up that there's going to be some kind of shutoff for it is that right? It's is it an automatic shut off or is it someone's oh, yeah. monitoring it and they shut it off? Yeah, it'll be automatic. So uh, this particular system utilizes a, a liquid cold plate uh, below each battery module um, that flows liquid through there. Between that and the fact that the overall operating rate of the battery is pretty low, uh, four hours is considered a pretty slow charge discharge for lithium batteries. Heat generation should be minimal. The cooling system should manage it. If it doesn't, yes, there is temperature monitoring throughout each of the individual mod modules, and it will shut that module and that rack off. All right. Thanks. Yep. I would also add that those shutoff temperatures are usually uh, a small fraction of what the actual failure temperature would be. Usually, you'll see shutdown between 50 and 55 degrees Celsius. You wouldn't expect to see failure in these cells until 185 to 200 degrees Celsius. And once you shut it down, does the the chance of the the possibility of the what's the term you use the, not, the thermal the power, runaway. thermal runaway end? Does that end once you shut it down, or does it is it, is the runaway that it it's reached like a critical mass and it can continue to increase and 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 run away? Uh, when, even though you, you automatically uh, shut it off? So the answer is it depends, to be honest. Um, okay. yeah. If the heating is purely a result of it just being a hot summer day and it's just getting a little more uh, sun than usual, uh, or if you have a loose electrical connection, then yes, uh, shutting it down should end any risk. Um, in the very rare instance that that heat generation is coming from internal to the cell as a result of an internal defect, then it would depend on the extent of the defect inside the cell, uh, whether or not it would fail. Um, to give you an example, you guys may remember the Galaxy Note 7 failures, you know, a few years ago. That's an example of thermal runaway. Um, yep. Stationary energy storage batteries have significantly lower failure rates significantly higher quality control than most of your consumer products. Um, we, I've been involved in a number of failures throughout the, the US and actually most of the Western world over the last four or five years. Um, of those dozen or more events, uh, only one or two potentially may have been related to a, a single cell failure. So uh, those kind of internal defects that would cause it are exceedingly rare. Um, so yes, ideally, if you had a a failure that was detected and you shut the system off, that should end the threat right there. Again, things happen, but I would yeah. say often than not, you should be good. But you that's why you have a second and third system exactly. back up to do it. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, great. How about other questions from board members? There's a lot of stuff. What I'm impressed with, I'll just say that I'm impressed with how new this is for the for us as a board. This is the first time we've dealt with something like this. There's a lot of concepts that are that I know I am, and I think many of you are unfamiliar with, and we're learning about this. And I'm impressed with um, the um, the amount of just the the amount of information you provided to us, your uh, candid nature and response to the questions. I think that's all been really good. I think we may have 
the need for a, additional information before we can make a decision before we're comfortable with that. And I hope you understand that that's because this is really sort of precedent setting. I'm not apologizing. I'm explaining why I think it's this is precedent setting for the the town, not so much for the ZBA, but for the town for us to do this. And so we're going to want, you know, we have some questions that we're going to want to have answered before we I before I'm comfortable moving forward on this. I'm definitely predisposed to think that this is a good idea um, and increasing battery storage makes sense and reducing our um, reducing that the peak draw which is the most expensive time to um, use power i mean it all makes it makes a ton of sense but we just need some answers i think to before we can move before i'm comfortable moving forward uh, but i think um you've done a, we've done a good job so far in trying to uh, identify the issues that we have to deal with so what i with that what i'd like to do is if anybody else has a general comment they'd like to make, we can do that, but I open it up to the public for comment, uh, and then we can come back and um, talk a little bit about the, going forward on this as a board, if we wish. So uh, if you have a comment, any board member has a comment right now they wanna make, um, it's time to do it before we go to the public comment. Ms. Parks. Hi, I just, I had some, just like a general question, like how does this help the town? Uh, do we get taxes from your use? Is that the is that the main benefit for the town, or does this support solar? Um, so I'm just thinking of those things. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, so certainly the most tangible direct benefit to the town would be in the form of uh, so the, the storage units would be personal property and it would be taxed as such. So. Um, there would be annual, you know, there, we're going to, we've been in communication with the assessor's office and we're working out how the system would be taxed, but there would be personal property taxes paid in the town. So that's the, the most direct tangible benefit. Um, additionally, as we kind of outlaid a little bit in the presentation, um, and, and as the chair just mentioned, um, the system, you know, one of the primary benefits of energy storage is the ability to shift energy, reduce peak generation, which uh, effectively reduces, uh, you know, peak generation costs and those costs that are passed on to the consumer. So uh, it will, you know, it, once enough energy storage is on the grid, that will make a measurable effect in reducing uh, electricity costs, not only for Amherst, but for, you know, all, all the, the Commonwealth. Um, and it does, it does uh, enhance solar. It's um, the state AG's office, Attorney General's office has defined energy storage as, as facilities or, or equipment that facilitates the collection of energy storage, um, the clean peak standard, which we mentioned, um, that was the state and DVR um, looking at energy storage and saying, hey, if, if you if we put out these systems and they charge within these windows and discharge uh, to other uh, in, in these peak demand times, uh, you're effectively spreading out that renewable generation. Um, and then also, you know, if, you know that, that, that kind of peak demand at evening time, it's going to grow as there's more EVs on the grid, um, as there is more just general electrical charging. Um, so energy storage really serves to just enhance peak shaping, uh, shifting renewable energy, reducing costs, uh, and added resiliency to the grid. All right, and then I also, um, it sounds like you are leasing the property from the owners. Is, is there an idea that you might purchase that property or will you continue to lease that? Sure. So um, at this time, we would just be looking to do, uh, and we're hoping uh, soon to enter into that long-term lease with the property owner. Um, again, with the potential to go as far as you know, 35 to 40 years. Um, at this time, we wouldn't have plans to purchase the property, um, and uh, that it could change. But I would, I would say that's unlikely at this time. Okay. But do you, I guess is there any concern that the that the property owners might want to sell the property if they wanted to sell the property? Would you be purchasing the property? Oh uh, yeah, uh, that well certainly they could sell the property. We wouldn't necessarily have a concern with it. We would have our lease. So you know, if someone else came in ownership of the parcel, uh, we would continue to have our lease, and we'd have you know the any new purchase would be subordinate to our lease. Uh, again, I don't think if they if they put it up for sale, I don't think we would. Um, we would potentially look to buy it unless, I don't know, unless we, there was some sense that a potential buyer would come in and be trying to cause a bunch of issues or maybe like, you know, had issues there, but we would likely, you know, 
get ahead of that much sooner uh, without looking to purchase. So. Okay, I just it's a, a long term, like a twenty to forty year lease is very long to me. I, I don't know about a lot of those, but apparently, I, I mean, I guess it happens. Um, all right, I think those. I, I guess is this happening more and more around the state? Uh, maybe uh, I even ask Craig or anybody else. I mean, is this something? Does this the next thing that's going to be happening is a lot of battery storage units going up? There's a lot of battery storage going up in different scenarios. In other words, we see you know solar systems with battery backup for them, like, but not to the same extent that this system is. Uh, there's a consideration for a large system out at Fort Irwin that uh, that has the potential. Uh, the VA is now looking at uh, any energy service agreements in conjunction with the energy savings performance contracts, which would probably encourage battery storage systems, but they're they're on a different level than this one. Typically, they are associated with um usually with with solar very occasionally with wind uh, for private entities or with the federal government uh, this is this is a utility grade and there's a lot more utility grade solar and battery 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 energy store solar battery energy so storage systems <laughs> going in. sorry i keep on stumbling on that uh, <laughs> It's, it, is it occurring more? Yes, definitely is. Okay, yeah, thanks. Just, just thanks. Follow, oh, go ahead, Ms. Just to follow up on Ms. Park's question. Um, in the operations and management section, there's a distinction made between the owner and the operator. So in this case, the owner is the trust and you got, and is it Blue Wave that is the operator? Is that the distinction, the correct distinction? Whoops, you're 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 muted, Josh. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, Blue would be in this case the developer and the owner operator. Yeah. And the owner operator. So it's the trust isn't the owner at all. It's you guys are the developer, owner, and operator. Correct. Yeah, the the trust would own the underlying land, um, but Blue Wave, the, the the company would own the project. So when it talks about, so you must have different divisions that would, so th these different operation and management plan that are, one is for the operator, one is for the owner, it goes to different divisions within your own company or Correct. different related companies. Uh, within Blue, we ha will have an operations team that would be handling asset management operations. Team, so. Okay, so it's all within the same corporate entity. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Blue Wave umbrella, you know, apart from some certain third party contracts, if it's like or other facets. But. Got it. Ms. Marshall. So we haven't talked about the decommissioning. Um, and I'm uh, wondering does the state have any requirements for decommissioning? Is it going to be up to us or is it up to the property owner? Um, does the industry have standards? What what would you be proposing to do in the way of decommissioning? Good question. So generally speaking, so for decommissioning a site, um, decommissioning for would be too involved in terms of the time and effort to actually just remove and you're gonna come take the take the batteries and enclosures off the site, you know, when you're on flatbed trucks or otherwise. Um, you would take out the concrete, any electrical conduit, um, and you know reseed and surface the the site. Um, also, the electrical poles, of course. Um, but all of that, all in all, wouldn't yeah. You you would basically, or we would remove effectively all improvements to the site and leave the site um, as close to the condition it was before we installed. Um, generally, in the past, when we've done same same as with solar uh, projects, typically we'll have an engineer do an estimate as to the cost of removing those pieces of equipment um, and transporting them offsite. Um, we'll, for the batteries, we'll, we'll look to uh, solicit ideally a local or regional recycling facility to take the actual 
underlying battery cells do. Um, other materials could also be recycled, um, steel enclosures, uh, you know, uh, concrete as well, even. Um, so as much as it can be taken take from recycling facilities, we'll do that. Um, but again, that cost estimate typically is formed. Uh, in the past, we worked with towns. Uh, we'll, we provide them with a cost estimate. Then they would have that reviewed by either their town engineer or maybe an external engineer. Um, if they feel that that's, the estimate is in line with what they're expecting, and then we would agree upon that that amount for the the decommissioning bond. Okay. Would you be removing the storage, the underground storage tanks, and the plumbing? Yes, we would remove those as well. But presumably the drainage, I forget what you call them, the infiltration no. that stays in place, or you remove and fill. The infiltration the is what I. It depends on those may stay in place just because it's there, you know, it's effectively stone filled trench. Um, but uh, th that may change, but that would be likely the only aspect of the site that would remain, remain in place. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wachella. I just want to suggest to the board that it would be wise to propose a condition where you require the applicant to provide a decommissioning plan with cost estimates from an engineer and a bond before issuance of a building permit to be submitted to the town. Um, so I'll take note of that, but I wanted to make everybody aware that that should be a proposed condition. Ms. Parks. Uh, just one last comment is I, I do think there you might want to put signage, um, not additional signage, but maybe painted on there that says you know, blue wave battery storage so that people don't wonder if it's penitentiary or something, yeah. big secret, <laughs> uh, you know, alien, you know, area 51. And marijuana, marijuana. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or, or, <laughs> yes, uh, to, to get rid of uh, interest. <laughs> in, yeah, in yeah I, exactly. Day. Something boring, okay. something very boring. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> I'm just thinking that, you know, once you see that, paranoid people will have imaginings, so. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, Blue Wave, the name of the project, and then contact information as well for, for anyone who's on site. Yeah, I think some, some kind of sign would make sense. It would probably reduce the number of uh, people that want to get in there and take a look at it. Um. All right, let's see if there's any public comment. So we have four people in the queue and nobody has their hand up right now. And also, I know that at, that at one meeting we did not, I did not give the instructions for people who are on the phone who, who may wish to comment. Can you, um, Rob or Chris, can you, what's the way in which a person who's on the phone and listening, if there is one, uh, do they just, do they press nine or? How do they how do they indicate that they're interested in commenting? So they're supposed to press the pound key according the to the key. agenda. Yep. Okay. All right. So we have no pound key and we have no hands up from the public. All right. Um, so I guess this is a chance for you, Mr. Laracy, or anybody, any of your colleagues to make a last comment before we um, we we may have some comments as a board here, but um, I, we're not going to finish this tonight, obviously. And um, th if you have other comments that you want, wish to make in closing, this would be the time to do it. No, uh, no, no further comments. The only thing I'll say is thank you for your time and all the questions. It's really appreciated um, as we work, you know, work through this. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to providing additional information. All I'd ask is just uh, if we can get, you know, clear direction on, you know, and we're happy to follow with Rob afterward and he can maybe confirm with um, you, Mr. Chairman, just the list of the specific information that you'd like to right. see by the next meeting and then we can uh, can be clear on our, our homework. Great. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Um, members of the board, um, we, had, we had a lot of questions. I think the staff had a, did a good job. I was, saw them taking notes. So I think they can come up with a list of um, information that we requested. Um, if you have specific things you have interest in, please uh, d um, communicate directly with the staff over the next couple of days um, about what you would be interested in, in learning about. 
but I think we pretty much, I think there's a long list of, of um, additional information that we, we would like from the applicant before we proceed. Uh, if there's anything else that you wish to have to speak to right now, that's the time. To do it. But um, I think we should, I think we should move to um, continue this hearing until a date certain. And I think the best time for doing that is, I think it's March, I mean, May, um, May 25th, I think is the next meeting. Uh, Not the next meeting time, but it's mm -hmm. the next free meeting. Is that yep. the correct date, Rob? Mm -hmm. Yep, May Chris? 25th. Okay. Uh, that's the fourth Thursday, so, yes. If you're all comfortable with that process, I would move, I would, I would uh, entertain a motion that we continue the public hearing on this matter until May 25th at 6 p.m. Uh, so that's about a, just about a month from now. So move. Do I have a motion? Ms. Parks and Ms. Marshall, you second? Any discussion? All right, um, this requires a vote. Uh, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Ms. Parks, aye. is that an aye? Oh, aye, okay, good. Yes. Mr. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Uh, Ms. Marshall? Can you hear? And Marshall Mr. Meadows? Aye. Aye. <laughs> All right, now I've lost all. Are you hearing me? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm not hearing you for some reason. Your AirPods probably died, Steve. I don't know what I've done. <laughs> there you go. Now you still hear me. Yes. <laughs> Can't hear you. Mm -mm. Can't hear you, Steve. Yeah, your audio is gone, Steve. Audio is gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did we ask our vice chair to uh, uh, take the roll call vote? <laughs> I uh, think we might get it. What, how you doing, Steve? Am I taking over? <laughs> Let's just All right. roll call. Everybody, thumbs up. <clears throat> Whatever. He's you took the vote to um, continue the public hearing already. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I don't think you need to have okay. another vote. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, you might have to change your microphone. Um, so, I think your AirPods were connected and that was your microphone. So, there might be a a way you can change it so it's coming through your computer instead of your uh, your AirPods. So I believe you go to the bottom left portion of your screen. There's a little microphone with an arrow. You click the arrow, and if you click, if you select a different microphone, that should be able to help you out. Mm -mm. No luck. Dylan, you're on. <laughs> All right. If uh, we've lost Steve, I'm going to go ahead and take it over. All right. So we had uh, Steve with an I. Uh, Ms. Parks. I. <laughs> I vote I. Mr. Meadows. I. Uh, Ms. Marshall. I. All right. So the uh, motion passes. The uh, hearing is continued to what do we have for the, uh, the date on that one? May Rob? 25th at 6 p.m. May 25th at 6 p.m. Yep. All right. All right. So, we dope. Go. We got Steve back. Yeah, I finally figured it out. <laughs> but sorry, guys. All right. <laughs> Appreciate the questions and uh, look forward to the next time. I will be sending you a um, and all the board members a list of all those questions and required updates tomorrow, just so everybody has them. Um, so just be on the lookout for that probably sometime tomorrow, midday. Sure. And we can, um, we'll, Rob, I can coordinate with you on uh, looking to schedule that fall up site visit with Drew. Um, I, I, you know, probably I assume if we can get it prior to the 25th. Um, yeah. We'll, 
that one would work fine. So. Sounds good. Great. All right. Yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you. Now's the time for public comment on um, any matter that was not before the board tonight. We have no, uh, nobody raises their hand, no public comment on items not before the board tonight. So we set the date for the next meeting. Ms. Brestrup, is there anything else that we need to discuss before we adjourn for the evening? No, there is just to note that the um, Zoning Board of Appeals is going to meet to discuss a different topic on May 11th with a different panel. Mm -hmm. So the spoke um, public hearing was continued to May 11th. So just wanted to mention that. Got it. Thank you. And the board members who serve on that panel will be notified as well of that meeting date. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, with that, I take a motion to adjourn. So, oh, uh, <laughs> oh, before before we totally jump into the adjournment motion, uh, I did want to let you know that it is this will be unfortunately my uh, my term ending uh, soon in June. So it will be uh, came up it came up faster than I thought, but unfortunately with my new job, I won't be able to uh, continue making Thursdays at six. Are you with us through May? Uh, I will be with us till, uh, yeah, until, when does the, the term end? Does it end June 1st or does it end June 30th? I, I don't even know. June 30th. Mm -hmm. So I'll be here through through June 30th. Uh, and then any uh, any panels that I'm, I'm on that continue beyond that, like if, I don't know, if Spoke continued, I might continue that one. But uh, if, if a 40B application comes to us before June, I'm, I'm going to probably have to have to refuse myself from that one. So yeah, yeah, you won't be around for that one. Yeah. No, no. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll save my, my real final goodbyes for when, when we get near the end. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sad to be leaving you guys. It's been great. And, uh, you know, I'll enjoy the time we have left together. And you've been great, Dylan. Thank you for being a part of it. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Congratulations on your job. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. Whatever. You thank you. I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm down. I just got a job selling uh, home improvement projects down in Connecticut. So, oh, wow. yeah, I'll be driving all over and some of the sales appointments you do are at 6 p.m. when, you know, people are, are home from work and it's... Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a lot, but uh, I, I think I'm, I'm going to like it. I've been at the company now for training for just a, just about two weeks, and it seems like a really good spot. They have like a great culture there, and it looks like, like uh, it, it, it looks like it's a job I'm really going to enjoy. So I'm excited. So for you. Congratulations. Yeah. Love to hear Thank that. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. And with that, I'm, I'll, I'll second the motion to, uh, <laughs> to adjourn. <laughs> And as we all know, this motion is not debatable. Uh, it's a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for all the work on this uh, long night. And, so, and I'm 